you, you felt, uh, I felt for the last three days that I am not away from home. Believe me. So, um, whose talk is first? Can you change this talk? Certainly at not my age going to be fit for tug of war with the young cardiologists particularly. So I'm we should treat or because both are complement each other. So there's no nothing to disclose. This is uh, one of the highest battleground in the world, Siachin. It is very important for Pakistan because we get the whole water supply from there. And unprotected left main coronary artery disease is Siachin of the heart. And it must be protected at all cost. The heart team approach is important and is now class one indication in coronary revascularization guidelines. So heart team is that the cardiologist and cardiac surgeon meet together and discuss what is the best treatment modality to be used in this particular patient. And the goal, goal of the heart team is to provide evidence-based optimum and best medical care to the patient. The left main coronary artery disease is very, very important. The reason is that the left main coronary artery disease ca carries very high prognostic importance as a result of large myocardial territory, which is at risk. At times, 100% of the myocardium is dependent on the left main. If you have got a patent RCA, about 75% is dependent on this. And if you block it, patient acutely, then patient is not going to survive. We have all seen patients who have complete blockage of left main and living. Now that is a chronic process. But if you have acute failure, which can happen all of a sudden in a patient who is uh, otherwise okay, or it can happen post PCI also. So acute blockage is dangerous. So the modalities available for treatment are PCI with its first, second, and so many generation to come of uh, drug eluting stents, and cabbage in the form of OP cab, on cab, or RT, which where we put RT or vein graft. 
Now, cabbage versus uh, PCI, as I discussed, uh, there are combined randomized control trials, Syntax, Pre-Combat, Nobel, and Excel, and in patient-level meta-analysis, suggested equipoise in outcomes, in death, MI, stroke. And death as a single endpoint at five years is higher with PCI. So why um, this is happening? All the randomized controlled trial meta-analysis, if you look at the Bayesian approach, it suggests that a difference favoring cabbage probably ex exists. And the patient treated with PCI had higher rates of spontaneous myocardial infarction because of acute closure and repeat revascularization over five years. Then the comparable group of cabbage. And that this reason for equipoise are the average outcome in a heterogeneous group of patients which we see in these studies. But we should look at the subgroups which we will do in this talk. And limited availability of sufficient data and statistical power in the subgroups. So what are the factors where we decide and which favor cabbage? Left main is very variable uh, artery. Left main coronary artery can be short, favoring certainly uh, cabbage because the stent will not hold there. Or it can be a trifurcation disease with the LAD circumflex and the ramus intermediates in the middle. Nowadays, if you look at the anatomy and the lesions in the left main, they can be classified into three categories. The osteal lesions, and they account for about 26% of the lesions. Then the shaft or the body lesions, which account only for 8%. But the majority of cases are at the bifurcation, and these account for 66% of the lesion. Now, Alfonso Modena is a cardiac surgeon, and he described uh, Modena classification of the le lesions. It's very easy to understand. If an artery is going and is giving side branch, you look at the main artery, and it causes a proximal part and a distal part and a side branch. So proximal part, if there is disease, it is labeled as zero. If uh, one, and if there's no disease, it's labeled as zero. So that's how you move on to classify one for proximal. Then if there's a distal disease also, you classify into one. And if the side branch is also there, then you classify it and, and give another score of one. So it could be disease of zero, one, one, or zero, zero, one, or one, one, one. And Modena classification, the more higher it is, will give better results with cabbage. The other thing is that the circumflex, it emerges out of the left main at various angles. If it is coming out at right angle, then that favors coronary artery bypass graft surgery. The other thing is that what other factors play important part in decision making are the site of the left main coronary artery disease, associated disease outside of the left main, diabetes mellitus, surgical factors like age and other comorbids, circumflex artery size and its angle, and the achieving complete revascularization, because that is important. This is a study just uh, came out, July 2023, in the annals. And they look at nine studies, three of these were randomized control trial and six were adjusted observational studies, six, uh, 6,296 patients, 2,274 had osteal and shaft disease, and 4,000 odd patients had distal left main disease. And they found that uh, if you look in the middle, that uh, in osteal and shaft, in terms of repeat revascularization, stroke, MI, death, maze, PCI is favorable, but when it comes to distal, then cabbage is much better. And the conclusion is that among patients with distal 
left main disease, coronary bypass is associated with lower incidence of maze and revascularization compared with PCI, whereas no difference in outcomes were observed for osteal and shaft disease. This is general of thoracic cardiovascular surgery. 23. So this is what, this is the diagram showing what they found. So we have to now differentiate between isolated left main disease of shaft and ostium and leave that to cardiologists. But when it comes to left main bifurcation disease, I think surgeon should come in. And this is supported by various other studies here. The combined Korean MC study, the main compare study. And whenever there is high syntax score, that also favors thir uh, above 32 cabbage. Excel trial ex excluded these patients from randomization, those with uh, left main also. And Nobel trial had left main but didn't include left main equivalent disease, which is just after bifurcation. So I will now come to the subsets of the left main stenosis, which, uh, which are important. First of all, the diabetes. In all the diabetes patients with left main, cabbage is favorable strategy. Age and gender, both Excel and Nobel trials provide subgroup analysis for their prospective uh, primary and endpoints, which suggested an enhanced benefit of cabbage relative to PCI in females and in patient aged above 67. Left ventricular impairment and three registries demonstrated a benefit of cabbage over PCI in those with moderate to severe LV impairment. The IRIS main registry, the Credo Coyote registry, and the Core Health Ontario registry. So now, when we are deciding, we should look at this chart, that there are factors like clinical characteristics, low EF, concomitant cardiac surgery, when you do not want to give uh, dual antiplatelets, and anatomical site of the lesion, which favors your cabbage. On the other hand, urgent revascularization, serious uh, comorbids, reduced life expectancy, and if it's an osteal or shaft lesion, then it favors PCI. So in decision-making, morphology, complexity, age, gender, LV function, diabetes, and expertise and resources available in the center are very important. I and you would like to drive this car when you are on a road. Very good, comfortable, both for the passenger and driver. But at times, this car would not take you here. So you need a, spe a special vehicle like a Jeep. So these are the two strategies you use in your daily life. Now, at times you can, uh, if you have a Jeep, it can be off-road and on-road both. So whenever you are deciding, if you have a hammer, every problem is a nail. So don't do that. I thank you here. I think we'll uh, take the question after the next talk. So. Okay. So we've heard the cardiac surgeon's point of view. To enlighten us from the cardiologist's point of view, I'd be calling on stage uh, Dr. Uh, Assistant Professor Dr. Kaiser Alim Saab from Shawan Institute of Cardiology. Sir. Assalamu alaikum and good morning everyone. Um, many thanks for the invite. First of all, I'd like to congr congratulate our um, cardiac surgical team. They've put on an amazing event together, got some good speakers. And uh, 
It's a bit scary being in front of the cardiac surgeons, but it's going to be interesting as well. And, uh, you know, I thought, you know, the last uh, presenter, Sami Saab, I thought, you know, it was going to be, and I do still do think it would be quite interesting to see what the surgical, you know, how, how, the, how you guys think as a surgeon. And, and now you, get, you guys get to see what we think as cardiologists uh, when we're doing left main angioplasty. So those are my uh, disclosures for this uh, presentation. So um, I just wanted to be clear. Look, uh, this is you know the original paper from 1994. You guys have done an amazing job, and the uh, this graph, the Kaplan Meier curve, this is where it was from 1994, when bypass was uh, you know it, bypass has been around for a while, but this was a direct comparison, head-to-head -head comparison of bypass with medical therapy and there's no uh, doubt about it you know the separation of the curves are happening quite early and the old time mortality benefit is clear uh, so yeah bypass versus medical therapy no doubt so but now we have to think of you know cardiologists are you know we're kind of pushing the boundaries and really I wanted to put this slide up now I do want to emphasize that the data that you're referring to is uh, does include you know, older generation of stents. And from our point of view, when I'm thinking of angioplasty, I think thick stent strut, more than 120 microns. I'm thinking what kind of antiplatelets were around. I'm thinking where the imaging, you know, the imaging technology was not available at the time. So, and we know for a fact that all of these uh, uh, modifiable effects do improve the angioplasty outcome. So I just thought I'd show you uh, this picture. Uh, which I found on, on uh, Google, which is quite apt, you know. So and you know our uh, I guess iterations of stent they keep on changing. We we keep on evolving with thinner struts. We've got better m medication, which we know are working uh, better to improve outcome. And this includes all kinds of medication, including lipid lowering therapy and antiplatelets. Uh, ultimately, this has resulted in better outcomes for our patients as well. And uh, angioplasty is here to stay. So I just thought I'd show you this uh, picture. You know, the, this is the projected money that's going to be spent in the US alone. And that's a crazy amount of money, $23 billion in the next 10 years and one financial year. Where, uh, and uh, I guess uh, the reason why I'm putting this up is because the, the main reason why uh, the cost of angioplasty has gone up is because of left main angioplasty. So when we're doing left main angioplasty, we like to use IVIS or OCT. We might do a pressurized system to assess the flow of blood within the vasculature. And, uh, you know, this, and, and more expensive uh, therapy in medic medication. So this is what I'm kind of feeling at the moment. This looks like a hawk to me. I don't know which kind of hawk it is, but <laughs> I don't know what it's got. Uh, you know, there's a little bird or fish or something torn off the head. and. That's, I guess, you know, what I'm kind of feeling in front of you guys. You guys with your predator eyes, uh, looking at a, you know, a lonely, and a humble, uh, and innocent cardiologist. But uh, I think it's equally a time for all of us to consider, you know, a humble, you know, being humble and look at the data and, and speak and let the, the data speak for itself. Actually, and I, when I say this, I don't mean you surgeons in particular. I also I'm saying that to myself as well as an interventional cardiologist. So uh, when we talk about the left main angioplasty, you know, we've, you know, in, this, in, in a very strange way, um, so, uh, you know, the cardiologists, we're very good at the churning out data and we're very good at uh, conducting trials and I'm sure you guys agree. And in some of these trials actually, despite you guys not being involved, uh, you know, we're actually generating the data for you. So uh, it's, it's quite interesting. But, you know, and there are, we have, uh, you know, I noticed that Sami Saab was um, alluding to registry data. We actually actually have randomized data, you know, with head-to-head -head comparison. And the, 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 the subset of the slides that I'm going to show you, showing you is a direct head to, you know, one-to-one -one comparison between left main PCI and the cabbage, not all comma three vessel or anything. This is subset analysis, left main PCI. And what's even more interesting is you just need to learn one trial or the outcome or result data of one trial, and it's applying to all the trials consistently.
So this and, and the, the signal that we're getting in interventional cardiology has been consistent, and you'll see this in a second. So the first trial that I'm sorry, I got my little piece of paper, so I don't forget the trial details. But the first trial uh, that was conducted that really set the pace for left main angioplasty was the left uh, main uh, Lehman's trial, and this was a direct one-to-one -one, uh, comparison, prospective, multi-center trial, small trial, uh, 100 patients. But, um, you know, um, and, and what they did was they uh, did selected patients for PCI with low to moderate syntax score. So they didn't include the high syntax scores, but they did include low to moderate. This is in 2009-10, by the way. Small trial, and I'll show you the results. And the results over here, you know, they're actually clearly showing the, the, the composite outcome of cardiac death, stroke, um, repeat revask. There's, there's actually not much difference. It certainly numerically, I guess you could say, you know, in, in this case, actually, cabbage had a slightly more event rate, but the, the numbers are very low, so you can't really make any uh, logical conclusion. But certainly, this study did kind of demonstrate that there's uh, perhaps equipoise, and it proved the point that LMS PCI was a considerable option. And this is the follow-up data of the same trial for 10 years. You know, 10 years follow-up, you know, that's a long, that's a that's long follow-up, right? Okay, so, I mean, uh, I know that you guys as surgeons, you like to see the follow-up data. This is the follow-up data. The follow-up data from uh, this trial, which is 100 patients, again, it's very small, but it's consistently showing that the event rate, uh, you know, is, you know, in, in this trial, it's numerically, uh, the, the, the bypass had a slightly, well, low, but there was no statistics statistical difference between the two, and it did, like I said, this trial did show uh, at least it proved the concept that this could be considered. So the next trial that I want to allude to is the pre-combat trial, and I don't know why the, why the name of the trial is pre-combat, because it doesn't make any sense, but uh, this trial is basically a direct head-to-head -head comparison of serolimus eluting uh, stenting versus a uh, oh, bypass operation. Now again, I would like to stress again, the serolimus eluting stents were the first generation of stents, right? It's taxes, stent. These are dinosaur generation of stents. So as I said before, so the, the, the data that I'm showing you is basically quite old. And um, so, you know, in, the, in this uh, group of patients, uh, this was a South Korean study, I believe, um, 13 centers, multi-center trial. And basically what it did show um, was straight head-to-head -head comparison. And the next slide, I believe, uh, I don't know if you guys can see the, um, the event rate again uh, for the outcome, all-time composite outcome of MACE, which was cardiac death, all-cause death, stroke, MI, repeat revask as well in this case, was actually both lines are pretty much parallel. So. Um, Again, this is kind of signaling the same kind of thing, that there's actually perhaps equipoise between the two uh, groups. I can actually, I've not brought my glasses, so I can't actually see the, <laughs> uh, the complete list, but I'm trying to have a look over here. Uh, oh my God, the surgeons are gonna help me. Thank you, thank you. Oh, thank you so much. Signs of getting old, I'm so sorry. Oh God. Yeah, so the, uh, <laughs> I'm so sorry, I'm so sorry. So the second graph actually uh, does show. I'm at a two plus now, I don't know why, I've lost my glasses. Two plus three. Honestly, I've said that will be good. That is so the <laughs> so the second graph again um, showing the uh, so this was the composite uh, of death, MI, and um, stroke. Again, both lines are parallel. There's actually no difference between the two groups. And really, um, this graph over here, the bottom left, is all-cause mortality. So all-cause mortality between uh, the two groups, 300 PCI, 300 in cabbage, no difference. Um, yeah, so okay, the bottom right, and I know that the surgeons love to get on the bandwagon about this, is target um, lesion revascularization. Yes, uh, we, and, and this is, like I said, so, 
you remember one trial in the interventional trials for left main PCI, and you're going to see this pattern consistently. All-cause mortality, not much difference. Cardiac death, not much difference. Repeat revasc, yes, there's a difference. PCI, you know, angioplasty is going to lead to a repeat procedure. You know, patients are probably going to have to come into a hospital again for another procedure. Then. And <clears throat> in you know, of course I'm biased, but of, the, you, you do have to think, well, okay, well, what does that mean? I mean, okay, I get a repeat procedure done. Is that really that bad? When all-cause mortality is no different, and you'll see the same kind of signal consistently. So I'm just going to go on to the next page. This is probably a bit premature because this, uh, well, these two trials and the subsequent trials kind of informed us of our... Uh, management style of how we would go approach left main PCI and basically what this slide is saying is from low to moderate uh, um, syntax scores left main PCI was and you know it was a, a reasonable thing to do so I, I don't so this is another trial actually uh, I think this is a French guy who conducted this Eno Burio, Burio and what his um, uh, again, so this was a randomized control trial to a direct head-to-head -head comparison of serolimus eluting stents versus a bypass. Um, and this was, uh, this was actually a non-inferiority trial, just like the other trials, a direct head-to-head -head comparison. Um, and what, what this showed, again, is that the primary outcome, which was a composite outcome of uh, cardiac, all-cause mortality, cardiac death, MI, and stroke, was again not much different. So, I don't know. That, okay, there you go. Let's change. So the the lines at the top, you know, they're pretty parallel, and um, <laughs> I can hardly. But I know that this is the old cause mortality line, uh, the top uh, graph. Um, I can't even see that. It's not projecting well. Yeah. Yeah. Basically. Huh? Can, can you have a look at the in the at the bottom? Yeah, the bottom one. I you can't see either. <laughs> <laughs> He's, he thought he could see. But essentially, uh, this trial again proved, uh, well not proved, but it, it was kind, it did show the same signal again as the pre-combat trial, that all-cause mortality, same, cardiac death, the same, and repeat revasc was more higher in uh, the PCI arm. Uh, this trial did uh, actually show that the stroke event, the event rate of stroke in the bypass group was higher. Uh, but again, good news for you guys, you know, the, gener the data that we've generated uh, later on has actually ensured that there's equipoise in the stroke, as stroke group as well in subsequent meta-analysis. So, uh, so the next trial, which is a very important trial actually, is the syntax trial. So this is the, um, a very, very important trial, the, you know, multi-center, uh, multi-randomized, head-to-head comparison, and, uh, you know, left main, you know, PCI was a, uh, there was a definite pre-group uh, for analysis, so it's not like uh, the data had to be recollected or reanalyzed. There was a subset of population within the group that had left main disease. Um, so this was going to give us more information uh, when, when it comes to outcome for this trial. So now, I want to stress again that the next slide that you're going to see is very specific to the outcome for left main PCI in the syntax group. So this is not all co not three vessel disease bypass versus PCI. This is left main PCI versus um, a bypass. Uh, the, the trial was designed to be to demonstrate non-inferiority. For statistical reasons, they actually could not uh, demonstrate that. But again, the, the results that you're going to see are going to be interesting. So uh, again, we're seeing the same kind of pattern. The total event rate, which is the top left um, chart, uh, you know, in, in this trial, actually, although numerically uh, bypass has come on top, but this was not statistically different in the left main PCI group. So it's really interesting. So, uh, so, so the top right, again, and uh, the, so when you, when we talk of, uh, you know, it's, it's, uh, it comes down, to, in all this discussion knuckles down to what kind of outcome do you want? you know, in, in, a, in a trial with the primary outcome, what's going to be part of the composite outcome? And really, were you looking for all-cause mortality, uh, and cardiac death, and death? And again, the, these are really the pretty, pretty important ones. 
uh, and sometimes in the interventional trials, the repeat VWASC is added, and sometimes it's not. But in, in this study, you know, in the left main sub-analysis, in the syntax trial, that's showing equipoise between, between two groups. Um, and the, well, again, in the graph of E, that what it is showing is in that the repeat VWASC procedures uh, and spontaneous MI, numerically, we are high in the PCI arm. Uh, and to be, in all fairness, the non-inferiority of the trial, uh, uh, the reason why we, it was, it couldn't, it didn't pass the statistical method was because of the re repeat revask. So in a way, if you took that out, there would be, it would come out, uh, you know, it, it, would, it would come out as non-inferior. So, but, but that's a separate discussion about what kind of outcome you're going to put in the composite outcome. So, now, so, so this is a really important slide. So we've just got 10-year follow-up data on the syntax 10-year um, follow-up, which has been published. And what, is this, uh, what this has actually sh demonstrated is uh, that in particular, left main uh, PCI, there was no difference in the 10-year follow-up with left main PCI versus bypass grafting despite them being diabetic, uh, but they, yes, but, but in this, uh, the follow-up data for this, does, it is restricted to low to moderate syntax scores. But more importantly, the all-cause mortality was again not different. And this is a big trial, really. Sy syntax, you know, is, is a huge trial. Um, so something that you can't really ignore. And by the way, the left main PCI subgroup of this trial uh, I've just got the numbers in front of me. There's more than, so 700 uh, patients went into the PCI arm, roughly, and about 350 patients of them got uh, angioplasty to the left main. So we're not talking small numbers here. Anyway, so, uh, I'm sorry, I know the bell is rung, but I just want to finish these slides, really. So the um, next uh, slide is, is the Excel trial. So this is the only trial which is actually demonstrated. So in this trial we used, uh, this is a big trial, and we used second generation stents. So slightly better polymer, slightly better st strut thickness was low. And this was a direct head-to-head -head comparison between uh, bypass uh, and left main angioplasty. So this really was the first big trial uh, which was now looking at, you know, huge numbers. So this is a, you know, um, a trial conducted by um, the Mount Sinai group, Greg Stone, you know, pr pretty much the rock stars of interventional cardiology. So they come out with a lot of data. And, uh, you know, the, the, again, the results that we are seeing are, you know, they, they're, they're pretty amazing. So, yeah, the death from all-cause mortality, the top left, it is showing that the PCI group did have numerically more event, the, the event rent w was higher. But again, this was not statistically different. Uh, uh, for you guys, the stroke rate was slightly higher, but this was not statistically different. Uh, our, the, interestingly, the myocardial infarction subset analysis does show this crossover, and PCI eventually, beyond three years, had more spontaneous MI. And uh, the, to the bottom right does again show repeat VWASC uh, is more in the... Um, PCI arm. So we're seeing this signal again and again in multiple trials that um, ischemia driven uh, revask or target lesion revask is more in the PCI arm, but all cause mortality, no difference. So, th so this is a really interesting. So the, the last trial, well, trial that I wanted to mention is the Nobel trial. Now this is really interesting because the Nobel and the Excel trial actually pretty much came, they were reported more or less at the similar time when they were presented. Very similar trials. Again, head-to-head -head comparison, both using second generation stenting. This was again a huge study, more than 36 centers involved, international study, uh, in non-inferior trial. And the outcome again was a composite, uh, the primary outcome was a composite outcome of stroke MI uh, mortality. And what this uh, actually showed, I, can't, I don't know if you don't know if you guys are seeing this, but the again the event rate um, was oh goodness, this is I should have brought my glasses. 
But again, again what this showed, the noble trial again showed that the target lesion revas was more in the PCI arm. And actually the data, when, uh, and this was from the trial investigators, when they took the, uh, that part of the outcome out, the data was actually more or less the same like Excel, which was the previous trial. So, so in Excel, they, the target lesion revas was not part of the composite outcome. In Nobel, it was part of the outcome. And that's the reason why it favored bypass. So when you take that part out of the trial, the data is more or less the same. Um, and I just wanted to allude to, I know that uh, Prof showed you a meta-analysis which is recently published in the cardiac uh, surgeon journals. So from an angioplasty perspective, we've got some, um, you know, two good uh, meta-analysis. And again, what they're showing is, all-cause mortality, not much difference in between the two groups. Um, and this is the uh, risk of stroke. Slightly um, more, I think, on the, well, again, not really, not much difference. So again, so this preconceived thought that stroke was perhaps more, or there was a higher risk of stroke in the bypass group, our meta-analysis is kind of saying, well, actually, that's not the case either. And th by the way, these numbers are up to 5,000 patients of randomized patients, head-to-head -head comparison, not registry data. This is like one-to-one -one straight head-to-head -head comparison. Uh, risk of cardiac, so risk of cardiac death, again, the same. Um, a ris risk of MI, although in our previous uh, individual trials, they, they have shown that you know PCI was slightly more uh, the, the spontaneous MI was occurring more in that group. The meta-analysis is kind of suggesting that there's actually equipoise between the two. Although, the, again, the repeated revask uh, slide does show that it's more common in um, PCI group. I just wanted to allude to another meta-analysis very quickly. And what this is showing is, again, the same thing. So my, my conclusions for the looking at the data are, are, are the following. Um, there's high evidence of data for left main PCI, and I think consistently what we've seen is it, it is non-inferior, especially in the low to moderate syntax score groups. Number two is that repeat revask and spontaneous MI do appear to be numerically high, and that's what's driving the composite outcome of the trials in favor of bypass. It's not all-cause mortality, and it's not cardiac death. And I think this is pretty, uh, you know, from from uh, our point of view, that's important to, uh, to us clearly, but I think from a surgical import, uh, point of view, that, that should be considered when taking somebody for on, on the table. And I know that I, you know, this is kind of me trying to convince uh, you guys or trying to open, you know, to kind of trying to make you understand what we are thinking of when we're doing a left main angioplasty, but hopefully I've tried to manage to convince the jury. And that's me, thank you so much. Apologies for the delay. All right, so one addition for the next organizers, do check the eyesight and provide glasses, glasses to the speakers as well if they forget. All right, uh, nice presentations, uh, very hot uh, uh, topic uh, for the last few years. Uh, question, uh, first, then I request Dr. Abedullah if you can please join us here as part of the panelists. Uh, sir, you can give me a mic. All right, so Hello? we start with Hello? questions. Just a few quick questions, maybe. Thank you. And <clears throat> I guess cardiologist himself at the end concluded that it's non inferior. It's like Hello. At the end of the day, today, at the World Cup, India saying, we were non-inferior, but we lost. So, instead of calling it lost, we call it non-inferior. But my uh, recommendation, and at this time, it is coming to that, because once you are trained, you can do Lima to LAD in less than 45 minutes. Skin to skin, you can close it. My average time is 45 minutes. I have done it in as low as 31 minutes. Sometimes you are lucky and memory just falls down. There is no reason to be doing FFRs on these things. There is no reason, especially if it's a proximal. 
Why do you need even another graft? If it's osteole and just put a lima to LED, when the patient goes to work in three days, you just have to control their pain. So if you look at the data, it's like talking in 2011, the data from those. So now you will see, start seeing by 2025, I expect, that we're going to see a lot of comparisons and how Lima to LED is a battery graft. The only issue to resolve is left is nobody has done vein compared to stents. Which one lasts longer? They are improving on stents. We are not finding any way to improve on veins. Actually, we are getting worse because either we do skip or we do endoscopic. And every study has shown that fillet open leg gives you the best vein because you are not pulling and tugging on it. But then if you have opened the entire leg, what good you have done doing the minimally invasive? So it, ultimately, it's going to set up on a hybrid. We know Lima is beneficial. We'll do the Lima, and they will do the stent under even same heparinize. You don't even have to extubate the patient. They don't have to look for the artery. We will provide them artery too. So they don't have to read. We will provide them glasses. That's all we do. We just help them. So, so uh, just to remind, like, um, the dinosaurs' uh, <laughs> age uh, stands, I, I think dinosaurs do have Lima as well, right? Yeah, they had Lima as well. Yeah, okay, so the yeah. uh, so first thing to uh, say is that we actually know, we know already the event rate from SVGs uh, because we've got the data. So 10% of SVGs are occluded before the patient leaves the hospital and they're unaware of anything. So that, that data is, you know, that's out, so that's one thing. The second thing, again, that I, you know, the, all this data that we have, it, it is important. You can't just say it's dinosaur age stenting because the stents have improved. We're not using IVIS. You know, there are ways to make things better. But I agree, I'm not, you know, uh, we all agree Lima is a great graft, but what I'm saying is the technology has advanced so much that, you know, it wouldn't be surprising that to have a comparison data, right, one-to-one -one comparison with, if you go full-on with IVIS, high-quality stents, the best medication, and then, yeah, that would be a good, uh, you know, a good trial. But I do think the, the, the what's lacking is a hybrid approach. And I, I'm not sure if there's any data for this, you know, Lima, along with the PCI to the other vessels, you know, that, that would be an amazing kind of trial to do. If you had a lima to the LED with angioplasty to the circle, right, versus, rather than SVGs, that, that would be interesting. But uh, that, those are my, my thoughts. Yes, I think a couple of points, especially I wanted to uh, just touch on the hybrid approach. Um, and we are planning a study on the, on the hybrid uh, reverse with a Lima to LAD and in the same setting or in a state setting doing the um, uh, PCI to the non-Lima uh, vessel or the non-LAD vessel. Uh, and we will present our data hopefully in the next uh, meeting of either cardiology or the um, uh, cardiac surgery meeting. The other hybrid approach that we have started with the RIC recently uh, is the distal LAD. So uh, usually we come across very diffuse disease in the distal LAD uh, and sometimes the endarterectomy might not help as well. So the one procedure that we have started doing is uh, uh, the surgeons doing the LAD to the usual position uh, and in the same setting we, we do a drug coated balloon to the distal LAD uh, and so far they are showing some uh, encouraging results as well. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure the debate will, will rage on, but I think the main uh, message that we can take from uh, meetings and discussions like these is, it's at the end of the day, it's going to be what benefits the patient, the, the heart team approach, the MDT, and the discussion before going to the patient. Um, and hopefully we don't leave our patient in a situation where they feel that I have been turned down for Lima and now I'm getting a second hand or a second choice uh, management. So I think that might be the, uh, the message which goes... goes so so taking Kaiser's point, like all of the surgeons here have... they are using Lima for every patient, right? Until unless the patient has no Lima. Yeah, so there's an agreement. But how many cardiologists are actually doing I was guided PCI? That's the question for 2023 today. Today, every surgeon here around the world, like he will use Lima if the patient has a Lima. 
But how many centers across Pakistan or abroad the cardiologists are doing IWAS guided PCI? That's where you showed the advantage, right? So uh, I will answer that. Uh, I think it depends on the, what setting you are in. Uh, if you are in, uh, in the UK or in the Europe, uh, you wouldn't uh, imagine doing a left main PCI without IWAS. Um, over here we have constraints. Uh, we try to do them as much as possible. We have the facility to do them and we have the expertise. Uh, but it comes down to the ground realities at times as well. So as I said, any cardiologist in a developed country wouldn't do a left main PCI without imaging. Dr. Zubair. So, so uh, I'll be kind of, I would uh, be the devil's advocate, okay? So what I would say is that the technology is uh, so constantly changing, and I agree that in the right setting, and the left main stenting also has its place. We cannot just totally throw it out of the window, especially if, it, if it's done with image guidance like IWAS. You do FFR, you do IWAS, you do IWAS post uh, implantation, that's good. Lima to LED is, uh, the, of course, it's a graph which has actually kept us in business. Otherwise, we would have been out after syntax, okay? Third thing is that the hybrid trials, there are two hybrid trials which have actually commenced and pretty much one of them has completed. Uh, one of them is actually done by John Puskas Group in New York. And the other one is a European trial the, for Puskas Group. The uh, uh, recruitment has been done. Now they are going through their analysis. The results will be out soon. And it's a randomized control trial, which is actually will provide us with some evidence regarding using uh, a hybrid approach, uh, Lima to LED, and then stenting the rest of the vessels, as uh, Kasser was saying. So I think there is a place for everything. The whole thing, the, the thing, as uh, uh, Dr. Abdullah said, that the thing is that you have to have the right approach for the right patient. Coronary surgery now is not a cookie cutter operation as it used to be like two, uh, 20 years ago. You have to have the right approach for the right patient. And that's where heart team approach or the multidisciplinary team meetings, they come in. So do you have a good approach to you kind of choice, choose the right revascularization method for the right patient. That's what the important message to carry home is. Okay. Dr. Asim. Uh, thank you so much. Uh, it was really a nice debate and it, is, it has sparked right for the few conferences. My point is, uh, at times we are actually not comparing the right groups. And that is, we are relying on the Western data. And over there, there is no limitation to technology. Uh, there is a false belief that probably surgeons rely on the angiographic data for the grafts. Uh, I, in my very short career, have seen many cases where the angiographic data is not outlining the target vessels that we find on the heart, which you can call the boost vessels, especially in the critical left main and post-PCI patients. There are many good targets which are not at all outlined by the uh, angiography, and we find them and we graft them. The other important thing is we as surgeons are keeping every patient right from 2006-17 right from 2016 that my independent practice has started in the two centers, every file, every patient is named, numbered, and traceable. Unfortunately, that's not the case in our cath labs. So if we come to this thing, that we document our data at the registry level, and then come on to some head-on trials, and then compare our population, then probably that will solve our issue. That's a very good point, uh, Asim. Uh, but now we are part of the crop registry. <laughs> Uh, and actually, uh, we as institution uh, is the highest contributor in the country to the crop registry. That's the cardiac care lab registry of Pakistan. Uh, so, uh, a very good point, well taken, but we, we are moving in the right direction. Uh, and uh, again, I will add to what Dr. Abdullah said. The whole thing is that, uh, again, being the devil's advocate, okay, I'm not trying to throw a spanner in the surgeon's work, but what I'm saying is that we have to keep our eyes open. The technology is there. Okay, mm -hmm. and it will cash to you. So we have to work together. Mm -hmm. That's what I mean. And the second thing is that uh, in terms of data and quality, quality assurance is something else. Okay, so quality assurance, for example, uh, you have been there, uh, we do it in a routine method, like TTFM is pretty much now uh, mm -hmm. standard of quality for surgical grafts. 
Yeah. How many times we do it over here in Pakistan? So that's another thing. So similarly, uh, post graft uh, imaging in terms of doing a TTFM and uh, ultrasound of uh, the vessel to see the patency. And there's good data from Taggart about uh, how sometimes you have, even you have a good flow in the graft, but the graft itself is not adequate. So quality assurance is something which we need to work on, not only in cardiac surgery, but also in cardiology. Data is also something which also we need to work on in uh, cardiac surgery and cardiology. And then we have heard a lot about this thing that there is, the Western data is different and our population subset is different. There is no doubt about it. But unless until we have our own results, we have to rely on the results which are there. Yeah. Okay. So the only way we can do that is that we have our own data and we bring it out and do a robust analysis to show where the difference actually lies. So I think we have to keep data not only in cardiac surgery, in cardiology. And uh, similarly, we also have to assure our own uh, quality assurance in cardiac surgery by doing graft flow measurements, by doing graft ultrasound to see how things are. Because now coronary surgery, as I said again, that it's not a cookie cutter operation, it's not a simple thing as Kasser has already pointed out, the data is there. Like 10% of the grafts, unfortunately, close before even the patient goes home. And we have all been there where patients have come back with graft occlusion. That's not something which so, is... So the we good can thing close is our eyes and we can say, okay, we are doing a great job. That's fine. But we have to open our eyes and see. We all have gone through graft failures. And this is, a, this is not something which is... And so conduit problem is also there. So the answer to all our questions is actually regional national data, right? We can't complain that we cannot compare just because of lack of data. So the first thing is to have data. And now we are part of, there are certain registries going on and uh, uh, pretty much work going into the databases and registries. So hopefully in the next few years, we will be having some sort of data from the surgical and cardiology perspective from Pakistan that, uh, that we can be uh, comparing with. Yeah. Dr. Sami, you want so, to? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I just would like to add that I think technology is there now. The IVERS plus now OCT in addition to that, both uh, looking at different aspect of the lumen. One is looking at the depth of the plug, the other one is looking at uh, the inside of the lumen uh, morphology. So these are complementary technologies which are coming forward. What I did in my talk, which uh, was done to a lesser extent by my counterpart was that he showed us all the studies in the gross form. I put them on the microscope and just looked at further down bifurcation lesion, the osteal lesion, the further subgroup like uh, poor LV, like old age, like female, like diabetes. So these are the group and these should things should come out as a result of these studies and the further studies and the meta-analysis where we should sit down and offer the best treatment to our uh, patients. The, the thing is that a patient is coming with a less severe left main stem uh, stenosis of bifurcation lesion and he is a pilot. He flies every day. <coughs> Will you put a stent in him? He is 40 years of age. On the other hand, a patient is coming with 80 years of age who only goes and uh, plays golf and experiencing some angina as diabetic. What are you going to do in these two subsets? So these are important things to be discussed and I think that uh, the further studies will reinforce uh, what we should actually do. Okay. So, so it's not just calling it left main. Yeah. Look no, into the left main and the other factors as well. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Uh, left main, the site, yeah. where it is, yeah. the morphology of the lesion, then uh, whether they come in any subsets which I described earlier, and then you have to make a decision. Okay. Dr. Shah Zayb. Okay. I would yeah. like to add okay. two parts. Uh, uh, sir, take a left out field. Okay. 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 <laughs> okay. It's okay. Uh, this was a great talk, especially by the Professor Sami Saab and Dr. Mm, Kaiser. I will just, uh, I am just agreeing to what 
Professor Shai Sami Sahib and Zubair Sahib have told. Uh, there are, some, there are um, a different group of patients, especially sometimes we receive the patient with acute MI in the cath lab. The patient has just used a lot of antiplatelets. Sometimes the streptokinase is just given in the periphery and the patient is in shock. We just receive these patients with the AVR up and this is just the osteal lesion. So I don't think so that these patients will just benefit just shifting to the OR and especially in that circumstance, definitely any interventional cardiologist and almost all surgeons will just agree that if this is just osteal isolated osteal uh, left male lesion, the PCI will be of great help. Um, similarly, the case with the frail patient, as Sir have mentioned, if the frailty score is quite high, index is quite high, definitely the patient will just benefit if we are just lifting these patients with just medical therapy, so it will benefit from the, the intervention. The other important thing I will just highlight is the uh, uh, patient, the cost. If the patient present to us just with the stable ischemic heart disease and maybe some a bit unstable and the patient with the severe lip main disease, the patient is young, diabetic, almost all the cardiologists will just refer the patient to the surgery for the lima to the LED. There is no match for the lima to the LED or the lima graph. But when there were some special circumstances is the frailty and the surgical declines the patient uh, with the acute setting, these definitely, uh, they uh, definitely especially got very more benefit from the PCI. And the cost also is an issue if the patient is just elective. So I, I was in the OCT usually just aid on cost. We are just referring these patients to the surgeon uh, versus uh, if we are just investing on these patients with these uh, emerging mortalities. Thank you. One Sir, please. I think the time has come when uh, we as a cardiologist and as a cardiac surgeon should join hands in doing many things across Pakistan because I don't see any across the nation study which has come forward. And uh, I've got a proposal here that uh, primary PCI you do in a lot of patients. There are few patients who come in when you do, do the NGO you see that the syntax score is high, but patient is with STEMI. So you address the culprit lesion, but this is a patient who is destined for cabbage afterwards. So you put a stent. Now there's a problem. The problem is that once you have stented the vessel, we are not sure what to do because competitive flow will close our graft there. So my proposal is that, and it will also save a lot of money for the nation, that if your lesion is very simple in the culprit vessel, then just do DET or uh, POBA at that time. And then very quickly, we can do uh, surgical revascularization in those patients. It will save the money. It will be a great study for uh, all across Pakistan if uh, several uh, units join hands. Uh, what do you think about this? So uh, I, I've got one com uh, comment to uh, say about this. So excellent idea, but uh, the data for this is quite clear. The uh, incidence of an emergency bypass grafting uh, following uh, emergency PCI, STEMI, whatever it is, is less than 1%. So even those... No, I'm not, not suggesting emergency PCI. Uh, emergency I'm suggesting... Bypass. Yeah. Uh, not, uh, uh, I'm suggesting emergency PCI, mm. primary PCI to the culprit lesion I without see. a stent, if it's feasible, if it's calcified, you think it's going to collapse, do deploy a, a stent. Yeah. Yeah. But if it's a simple lesion, leave it as such and then in, you know, three, four, five, one week, we will revascularize the patient completely. Yeah, definitely this is a great idea and sometimes whenever we see, the, especially in, uh, on my day and uh, also a colleague in the PIC, whenever we see a patient with uh, uh, the um, complex disease 
And uh, the um, culprit is just a simple, but overall these are cal calcified vessels. If the patient just present with inferior MI and the patient have the severe LED disease, complex uh, LED, uh, calcified LED disease, cerc also disease, let me also some lesion. Definitely uh, we love to have just do the POBA and so the DCB and refer these patients to the surgeon. This is so just the ideal. Uh, so Tariq and Kessar, we can make them a national coordinator and they can progress with Inshallah. a study like this. Well, Thank you. Hopefully, yeah. so I, I, can I just say uh, one thing? Sir, uh, uh, yeah, Professor Tariq, uh, for, you know, Yes, just so quick comments I from the panelists uh, and we should... We were missing flame uh, in this debate. <laughs> you know, problem with the PCI, we are not comparing apple with the, uh, with the apples, we are comparing apple with the oranges. PCI has lost its space in stable coronary artery disease. There is no role of PCI in stable coronary artery disease. So now these gentlemen are left with the primary PCI and the left main coronary artery disease. And you have seen the point uh, of view of a cardiac surgeon on uh, Excel trial. You have seen the BBC debate. 80% uh, of the randomized trial are driven by the, uh, are sponsored by the, uh, you know, uh, industry. There is a 23 uh, billion uh, dollar industry is involved. And let me to tell you, 90% of the sub-data of the randomized trial should be submitted for publication within one year. And 90% of the randomized trial data is not being submitted for uh, analysis and submission. Number one. Number two, we start, you know, uh, Coronary artery bypass uh, grafting is a different thing. Mechanism of grafting, uh, revascularization is different as compared to the uh, stenting. Thanks to cardiologist, 30% of my volume is post stented uh, coronary artery bypass surgery. I'm very thankful to them. And it's not only stent. Of course, they have improved, uh, you know, re stenosis in stent, but it's pre stent and post stent stenosis that's giving the problem and uh, I've seen many patients coming with a critical left main after a stent in LED. Uh, so uh, what I'm looking at uh, although there is a role of technology IOS and this and that uh, FFR driven coordinated bypass uh, grafting we haven't seen any advantage uh, in survival uh, after uh, doing coordinate bypass surgery with uh, FFR to treatment targets. So what I'm saying, okay, uh, keeping in mind the incidence of spontaneous MI and the mortality and morbidity associated with revascularization, which is very, very significant with the uh, PCI, you know, and they're not comparing the, you know, mortality and morbidity of revascularization uh, in the results of the trial. So uh, I don't think so. Okay, there is a you know comparison of PCI in left main disease with the coronary artery bypass surgery. Coronary, with the coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, you know off pump coronary artery bypass surgery, uh, left main you know routine uh, off pump radial to the circumflex and uh, lima to the LED, and I'm going to show you the long term outcome in our population. Uh, can, can, yeah, Tarek, I, I, can, I, can I just say one thing? I, I, I yeah, need to yeah, respond. Please, you know, please, 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 please. Uh, just, just, just some humor. Uh, so, yes, stable coronary artery disease, no mortality benefit. I've been, tra I've been lucky to have trained with some of the best interventional cardiologists in Europe and, you know, um, Mohaned, who I think uh, Dr. Rask worked with, you know. He, 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 he was, uh, we, we, when ischemia came out and uh, all the previous other signs that there was no mortality benefit and he would say well neither does a knee replacement have mortality benefit so does that mean I'm not going to do it so basically we're doing it for symptom relief and there's the data is clear that it is providing symptom relief and the orbiter trial the orbiter 2 trial has just been published two weeks ago and again that showed that angioplasty is still the right thing to do we're not saying and this is in stable coronary artery disease we're not saying that it's saving lives yes in primary PCI it is so that's one thing the other thing that I wanted to um, uh, you know say is uh, being trained in the West that I, I, medicine is regional and I've changed my practice and I kind of agree with Shahzeb that rather than spending you know basically the price of uh, a bypass privately doing an IVUS and a rotor, 
it's a kind of unfair and perhaps on the borderline unethical to continue with PCI and I've kind of stopped doing that because it's not the right thing to do and referred the patient to for a bypass because we understand that the high syntax score, the benefit for a bypass is still there. <laughs> but uh, th th those are my feelings. And with regards to Sami Saab's um, proposition, I'm absolutely all for it, any kind of trial data gathering. And uh, I'll, I'll have some good news soon because um, there are some, although again, it's, it would be industry sponsored, but industry is extremely keen on conducting trial in Asia. And because I have a very strategic relationship with them, they, they want this to happen. So, the, uh, so if, with regards to national yeah. data, it, regional Asia data, is a big market, you know. Yeah, of uh, course, sir. And th this is the this is where most of the money is now coming from. Yeah. They they want this to happen. So yeah. we, I'm happy to speak to Tariq, MD Saab, whoever. We're, we're going to make this happen, inshallah. We'll get our own data. But uh, Zubair Saab, assalamu alaikum. <laughs> By the way, <laughs> but uh, taking out a point from Zubair Saab, while we don't have the data, we have to extrapolate data from Caucasian data. We can't just say, oh, this doesn't apply to our data. Well, it does, because they still have a heart and they still have coronaries. And unless we generate our own data, you're going to extrapolate that data, which applies to us. Just uh, Dr. Asif Shah. Uh, Sorry, I, ju I would just like. <coughs> To make a comment, that debate since we started cardiac surgery was going on and still going on and will continue going on. Let's accept the advancement in the PCI. There is a huge advancement in the PCI and the results are quite, quite convincing. But having said that, to change your practice with the recent uh, evidence available which is keep changing and its interpretation of the evidence. It's individualized decision of every patient. Selecting a patient for PCI on cabbage, sitting in a worst when resources is not a problem, patient comes back with the ISR, open again, not a problem, while deciding the similar patient, sitting in here, what's the best for the patient, is a totally different decision making. So I think every patient decision making, when you put all the context into it in the long term, as we were talking in the Tavari and Savar discussion yesterday, it's the whole package look into it in this situation, in his financial situation, remote, which area is he living, if he has again MI, hope quickly we'll be able to make it, that whole package should be taken into consideration and then decided not getting biased the PCI or the cabbage, what's best for that individual patient. I think that's the most crucial thing. Right. Yeah. Dr. Asnath, you want to have a final comment on that? Yes, I have a few comments. Can you hear me? I have a few comments and concerns. Uh, some of them have been addressed already. You can't shove uh, repeat revascular revascularization under the carpet because there's a cost to as associated with it and we live in Pakistan. So that's one. The other thing is when you look at the evidence, you need to look at it very carefully. There is an intention to treat analysis. There's crossover between the two subgroups. And I think what Kess have showed, there were a few crossovers. Uh, you need to be cognizant about outcomes of cabbage after PCI. It is not the same in a, in a, in a virgin uh, uh, circulation. Non-inferiority design has been criticized. Uh, I know PC talked about it. People have even called it unethical experimentation. So that is a major point. We should look at that. Influence of industry we've talked about. And I think Kessel brings up a very good point about composite outcomes. Composite outcomes should not be looked at. Perhaps in the metrics, we should be including quality of life uh, as an outcome measure. Uh, if you look at the Syntex trial carefully, one third of the patients were not even randomized. They went into a registry and 90% of them went in for cabbage. And I think last and not the least is the database versus RCT uh, debate. Uh, I know the level of evidence for RCT is level one and database may not uh, come up to the same level, but that is real life evidence. And you don't need to extrapolate that data. That is over thousands and thousands of patients. Your RCTs can be down to only 50 patients like you showed. So I think uh, e evaluation of science is more important. And then I totally agree individualizing the decision making to the patient. Thank you. Dr. Shagar. 
for final comment, please. I, I just uh, want to make a couple of comments. I think uh, our cardiology, cardiology colleagues are our guests over here. And I think long after all the surgeons have left Peshawar, we still have to live with them. <laughs> so we can't be too rude. But I think I'm also very realistic. <coughs> uh, surgeons are at a disadvantage here. Big dis disadvantage. Uh, it's not only, you know, clear indications that go for surgery or go for uh, um, uh, PCI interventions. The patient has a big choice over here. Nobody likes uh, cuts on their body. And there is an inherent, uh, uh, you know, um, uh, on the part of the patient, patients would not like to have surgery done. Um, the, sur uh, the cardiologist is the gatekeeper. And uh, the, the first contact and, you know, if he offers a treatment where which does not involve a cut, it is very, very attractive to the patient. And I think, uh, you know, uh, I absolutely agree with, uh, with Asif. I think each patient is an individual and his treatment has to be devised and the best approach would be a team approach. And I think that's where the patient gets the maximum satisfaction that he has seen the surgeon, he has seen the cardiologist and he's got a combined opinion. Um, and, uh, you know, uh, has not said about the quality of life. We all know that once you have a stent in, you always live in fear. Uh, people are coming back, they have a, get a little bit of a twitch, they come to the hospital saying that, you know, the stent is blocking. And, uh, so all these factors have to be taken into consideration. And um, I think at the end of the day, it's the patient who decides what kind of treatment he wants. He should be given, uh, uh, you know, an evidence-based uh, decision both by the cardiologist and the cardiac surgeon. I think we should live in tandem, not, uh, you know, one against the other. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. So nobody wants big cuts. That's why we have the next session, minimal invasive cardiac surgery. And uh, thank you to the panelists uh, for your presence here. Now we move on to the next session, and I would request the panelists to take over the uh, panel uh, desk, please. Uh, uh, Dr. Imran Asker. Dr. Essen Memon stays there. You don't have to leave. Dr. Ahmed Shibaz. No. Dr. Haris Pilal. Dr. Zubair Lukman. And with this, uh, to start with, I would uh, request uh, Professor Choudhury to present on ethics and mindset of an MICS surgeon. Over to you, sir. Good morning. And uh, sorry for waking you guys up early in the morning. I'm glad that a lot of the brand took the cardiologist finally for us. <clears throat> As you can see, this is a talk, and I wrote it specifically for that. This is a talk at a dinner table. When I go, and I, I've been teaching since 2008, the word mix, when we said, I don't know, I, th I don't think I can see with this thing. I see it. The word mix, minimally invasive coronary surgery. When it was invented, I was on that table. I've been teaching for Medtronic since 2008. I've been doing minimally invasive since 2001. A lot of your partners, yourself may be one of them, that you see a guy doing it, or you were part of it. And then after that, one is that you never got instruments in Pakistan because one of your professors said, no, I don't believe in it and we are not going to order it. There's nothing you can do about that. But you have instruments, you have the patients, and you know you can do it, but you don't do it. And it was so many of those numbers that people will come, they will watch me, they will talk about it, and then they leave. Then I met a guy named Jimmy. He was my mentee and he was 78 year old. So this example I give, 
that don't feel that you are old on it, that I'm not going to be able to do it or I don't need to do it. This is where we are on the pathway, just like we were talking about stents. They have progressed and made better stents. We stop progression because we open the sternum and we can access it, we learn it, and I'm comfortable with it. Mix is actually exactly same surgery. I've been teaching it, as I said, that since 2008. I have not told any surgeon, if somebody watches me do it and changes his stitching, I was using proline on the aorta and he was using methabon and he changed it to mine, that may have happened. I never asked a surgeon to change it. I put backhanded, you put forehanded. I just tell him, this is your stitch, you have to put it. You load the needle how you want to. So it's the exact same thing. It's an access that junior residents, I always tell them, this is actually, as I had it on the first talk, it's a resident, senior resident talk because those are the ones a bit afraid. Anybody who can put a patient on pump, take them off, and do the valve surgery or cabbage surgery can do mix. You may not be able to do all the grafts, but Lima to LAD, and I think that's where the debate at the end is going to settle. But it's an excess. Just like you, young guy, you were able to, with the parents' permission, leave through the door, came back home, nobody asked. Mm -hmm. Then you got teenager, and you still wanted to see the friends, but the parents didn't allow it. You found a way to jump through the window. Then you get so used to it, even when you're walking with the parents inside the house, you look like, Anna, aren't I walking through the wrong door? Because I'm used to coming at home through the... Now if I open a sternum, it makes me feel like that, that I'm harming. Why not open the sternum? Why not do the easy surgery? It's the medical ethics one requires us, because if we look at it, am I doing any harm to this patient? It's a big question. We don't think about it when we're planning a surgery. I must not do a harm. That's part of my code. I must be fair to him, give him the best treatment. That's all the talks about the ethics I'll talk. But you have to believe when you go on this path, minimally invasive, who you are and why are you doing it. You can do it just for profit. It's very profitable. And the talk after me, you will hear from how to set it up. Yasser is one of my students. And... Uh, then, what are the benefits of it? Why did I do it? I did it because when you look at the benefits of it, we talk about the pain, we talk about the cost, although it's cheaper than open surgery. But we never look at the patient that cardiac surgery with the steratomy is the only disease without cancer other than leg amputation that changes patients' dreams. I have seen people after steratomy being on the street while they were living in a normal house and their kids were going to school. Because 60 to 70 percent of our patients don't have three months of reserve that they can pay their rent, or somebody after the tsunami will give them a job. <coughs> you can sit with them in a bus, and they will tell you, when, they, when you have done tsunami, about 60%, a Canadian, latest study, Canadian comes out, about 60% patients go into depression. I've been doing minimally invasive, I've been in the learning process since 2002, but 
I've been independently, regularly been doing it since 2005. I have yet to see a patient who went into depression. It doesn't affect the life when you do minimally invasive. In five days they can go home and they can go to work that day. Why we don't do it? Because human mind likes to stay in the past or future. That's an easier path for us. We can be doing surgery and we can listen to music and we even remember where I listened to this music before. The difficult path is you have to live in present. Present is only two things. Either you are learning or you are teaching. Teaching is easier because you are repeating what you already know. When you are learning, you are learning new things. In cardiac surgery, in United States has gone way ahead. I have to take exam every five years. When you have passed FCPS, do you know you never need to take any exam again? You never need to read a book again? You can just constantly keep saying, my professor did this way. So you have to turn on that I want to learn this. It's the exact same thing and I will explain to you in a sec. Choose a mentor, I think I missed a slide. Yeah, right there. Choose a mentor, your mentor doesn't have to be that he is doing minimally invasive. Your mentor is you who you can talk to. Who cares about you? Who you are not threat for? and be able to comfortable. So he tells you like, maybe this way, maybe think that or you are missing. He can help you. Your operating room is just like your home. Your husband with the no say so, and your anesthesiologist is your wife who has all the say so. Yet he has never ever go to the patient or family and tell them what was the outcome. When I talk about heart failure, Again, you are the leader, you are the one running it. But cardiologists, you have to make them believe it's his program. Team, it always starts with one. When you build a team, make the hospital own the system. Own you. Don't tell them that you will make so much money for them that they will count out, come out of debt. You may. Cardiac surgery makes a lot of money. Any program which is doing more than 150 cases in a private setup is running that hospital. I know the numbers. I didn't want to, but I knew that. I mean, you heard the word data. I don't put the slides there. This is a mindset. I talk about these things night before the surgery when I go to other places. Getting the surgeon, but it's a table talk, I can see the body language. People get nervous. Have people in your team, even it could be anesthesiologists, who supports you on this endeavor. There will be always spy in every department by the administration. You want to make friends with them. Don't tell them. If they would have gotten me the American instruments, I would have shown you the results. No, tell them, we will get better. These are the benefits. Because that spy's job is to take what goes to the CEO. You want to get to the CEO, but not yourself. You keep going every day to the complaint, he doesn't want you there. He opened the hospital of money. He didn't open up charity. He's questioned. Even if it's a government hospital, he's questioned where is this going. So you have to have the people buy it with you. Making it short, I wanted to have it in the middle, questions, but I heard that we are going to have the questions at the end. 
only thing which turned my switch on. And what I'm trying to do is hopefully you are awake enough that it's a switch in your head. You will click that I can do it. And why should I be doing it? And how easy it is. If you look this slide and see or count all the ribs, every rib has a cartilage going to the sternum. Any time when you cut cartilage, it doesn't heal. Minimally invasive started with anterior thoracotomy and they thought that it was easy. Then the companies, the Robert Stewart no, uh, name you, he's one of my mentor. He was involved with the company and I have used the sutures with Ethmon fine wire with it. With just fine wires. With plates. Titanium plates on top of the cartilage. It never heals. It hurts the life. Then one day I came up with, I don't know where I was sitting and I thought about it. Well, bone heals with the bone. So I wish my pointer was working. Oh, no, it doesn't. You, do you see, guys? So idea is the sternum is about the lowest is at the second intercostal space. If you mark at it and if you look at it, the lowest number of the width, how wide it is, is right there at the second. We never go to the second intercostal and cut it. We go to the third. So for aortic valve, you are cutting the wedge. You just want a sliver of bone on the stern, on the cartilage. And on the way out, you just fit it back. All it needs is a vicral stitch. You don't even need to put the proline. It will in two weeks absorb, and that bone to bone he will heal. Since I have started doing the wedge, I've never had a sternal problem. Unless you go inframemory, and then you end up sometime breaking their cartilage, and that patient is yours. Once a cartilage, unstable cartilage, that patient is yours the rest of his life. He will keep coming back with the pain. Sometime the temperature change, sometime, sometime he exerted, he will have a pain. So if you look at it, visualize this heart. This is the entire patient. When a patient is laying on the table, you look at it. If you take third rib, enter second intercostal, but you take in the third rib wedge off. Look at the root. That's, for the, that's a lesion. That's an incision for your aortic root, I mean aortic valve. Look at the aortic valve where it is. It's right in front of you. You just have to pull the pericardium. A lot of patients aorta, unless they are redo and they are stuck, a lot of patients, aorta comes into your incision. If you look at the cavus, you go through the third intercostal, this time you are to, taking the two ribs, third and fourth, they both are being wedged. And look at the inferior vena cava and superior vena cava. You're right there, and once you have cannulated them, and your aorta, if, because you are gone into third intercostal, and you cannot put aorta, uh, aortic cannula directly, use Seldinger technique, put a needle in it. You don't need to cut it. The cannula can be pushed in. <laughs> Same thing if you look at the left side. You go through the fourth intercostal, and that's, by the way, the mix, going through the ribs. <laughs> Mid-cab is failed, and not people are doing it because there's no instrument we have developed that we can go to first intercostal or second intercostal. You end up leaving them behind. People can develop steel from that. So, if you look at that, and you just need to see once, anybody who has done memory from the center and can do it off pump, can do minimally invasive. And this debate of left main, unprotected, using impala in it, costing an IVIS, costing an FFR, all will go away. These are the, the middle incision. I put these all, first you comparing on this. That middle incision, I do aortic valve through the same incision. 
aortic mitral through the same zillion, mitral through the same zillion, mitral tricuspid, and all three valves. The difference is only what I showed you, the second intercostal or third intercostal. Okay, a lot of time we forget. Remember, intercostal comes below the rib, not above the rib. Another thing I noticed when I came here, because we don't do that much femoral access, your incision should never be below the inguinal ring. If you have made incision at inguinal ring or below, you are going into SFA. You will kill the leg. Most of our SFAs, especially in Pakistan with the smaller arteries, 18 size cannula will crush that vessel. You may end up making a hole in iliac or femoral. So entry is suprapubic, anterior trunk and trunk header. You put your hand. Divide that area into three. Open the middle third. And just roll this top part. I wish this, this thing was working. You just, you, the minute you go, you don't need to cut any muscle. If you are cutting the muscle, you're going into the wrong lane. You just pull that muscle up. You will drop into the inguinal ring. And you will see artery and vein right there. You don't need to cut anything. And as long as you are above the inguinal ring, Ingwin ligament, you are in the femoral artery. You are not in SFA. And as long as you have saved the profunda, leg will get perfused. This is one of our patients, and this is, I'm going to end it here. If somebody has a question, I'll be happy to answer. Thinking what I was talking about, that I can lay everything up top. So I wish again the pointer. If you look at it, you see superior vena cava. This is the surgeon is standing on this side. That hand is assistant hand. So you see superior vena cava, inferior vena cava, aortic cannula, clamp. Then your anti-grade plegia line. Then you have a retractor, atrial retractor lifting it up. That is your exposure on the, if you look at the far side. And you can count the same things in that same incision. Now how big is the incision, although it looks, if you look at the first incision, you can see the nipple of the patient and see the nipple line, and we are inside the nipple line. And that was a redo valve. So all of this is doable. Yes, you can do it. You just have to make up your mind. Thank you. Thank you for the time and thank you. For society. Thank you. That is uh, amazing work uh, by Professor Chaudhary. Uh, would quickly invite uh, Dr. Yasser uh, to present uh, <clears throat> on establishment, establishing a minimally invasive cardiac surgery program. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Thank you very much for giving me an opportunity to speak here. Uh, I'm not going to take much of the time because most of the things have already been explained by uh, uh, Professor Parvez Chaudhary. So I'm just going to share with you people the difficulties which we had in establishing our uh, program and unit three years back when we started this uh, very program in our unit. So this is our city. And this is our hospital, uh, Chaudhary Pervez Lai Institute of Cardiology. It's a big center. We operate at least 1,600 uh, open hearts a year. So what is minimal invasive? So the basic concept is that instead of cutting open the bone, uh, the sternum, we use small incisions. It's essentially the thoracotomy or the hemisternotomy rather than uh, going open through the sternum. So the benefits have already been explained. We all know that a smaller incision, superior cosmetic results, reduced risks of infection, bleeding, pain, less pain and trauma, decreased length of stay in the hospital and cost. And the important thing is that it's quick recovery time and quicker back to work. 
improved rehabilitation and facilitates reoperation at a later date. So we started the minimal invasive program at our institution uh, with, uh, uh, under the supervision of Professor Hadith Zaman three years back. We started the program with simple valves. Initially, we did uh, a lot of simple mitrals, aortics, some mid cabs, uh, single grafts, and then we gradually uh, started and switched to multi vessel cabbages. So, what procedures can be performed by this v approach? It is the ASDs can be performed, the VSDs can be performed, MVRs, AVRs, uh, DVRs can be performed, tricuspid valve repair can be performed, infundibular resection, RVOT resection, and tetralogy of phalloc. We have so far performed most of these procedures, means ASDs, we have performed a VSD, DVRs, we have been performed, and accept the congenital stuff. Now we are uh, routinely performing the cabbages on the beating heart with the help of the pump or on pump beating. So what are the indications for a minimum invasive cabbage? It's a single vessel, left main stem or proximal LED, which is not stentable, multi-vessel disease, and especially the hot topic, the hybrid procedures, that is, uh, Lima to LED and PCI to the non-LED vessels. So what contraindications we have seen so far, which we tend not to perform those patients on minimal invasive approach. The patients with small target vessels, calcified vessels, the vessels which are diffusely diseased, intramyocardial target vessels, emergency cases, morbidly obese patients, patients with ejection fraction less than 35%, and patients with peripheral vascular disease. We tend not to perform these patients with minimal invasive approach. So majority of these procedures are done through the mini thoracotomy, either on the right side or on the left side of the chest. Few procedures can be done using mini stenotomy approach like pentol and transcatheter valves. So why do we need a mix in Pakistan? The reason is that We've got a lot of younger population here, and the rheumatics is thus killing us. It is very cost effective, to be honest, because it's a one-time buy. If you're just going to buy the instruments, that's only for the one time. And when we uh, uh, compare the cost, the hospital cost, it becomes very less at the end of the day. So what is our approach? We do anterior thoracotomy for the valvular patients. We do most of the times the peripheral cannulation, sometimes the central ones as well. And peripheral cannulation we prefer for the multi-vessel cabbages. We do them on pump. So this is our setup already been shown by uh, Professor uh, Pervez Chaudhary. He's been our mentor. So you can see. So this is the AVR being done. The aortic valve is clearly visible. We are seating the valve down. Uh, it was a, a young lady, 45 years of age, with a large, uh, with the tight mitral stenosis, with a large clot in LA. So uh, her MVR with the tricuspid valve repair was done, and the clot was removed. You can see the huge number of the clot being retrieved from the LA, and we did it through the mini approach. So in terms of mixed cabbage, so these are the, some of the patients we've got data now, the three years uh, follow-up data, and all of these patients, uh, they, are being, they are doing fine. They are in uh, NHA, uh, NYHA class one, up and about, and uh, back to their routine work. This gentleman had triple vessel coronary artery disease. You can see uh, LED had two lesions, the osteal lesion and also another lesion in the mid uh, LED. So, Triple uh, uh, three uh, bypass grafts were done to this gentleman. It was a couple of years back and he's doing fine. We're, all, we're following up all of these patients till now. So this is our approach. This is how we do it. That's not working. That's not working. 
ये स्टॉप करते हैं क्यों नहीं चल रही इसको चलाए ना हाँ यस सो यू कैन सी दिस जेंटलमैन दिस इज द फ्लो ऑफ द आई एम ए दिस इज द पी डी ए ग्राफ्ट विच इज बिंग डन फ्रॉम द लेफ्ट साइड यू कैन सी द टॉप एंड द एट ऑफ द टॉप एंड एंड दिस टॉप एंड इज बिंग डन इन अ कन्वेंशनल वे इन दिस मिड कैप पेशेंट सो ही इज बैक टू वर्क द क्रैक्स ऑफ दिस मिड कैप इज दैट द पेशेंट शुड बी बैक टू वर्क इन अ कपल ऑफ वीक्स टाइम और एटलीस्ट अ वीक्स टाइम so these patients uh, this gentleman uh, followed up with me after 6 months and he had uh, four bypass grafts done <coughs> this is after two years so he is doing fine uh, this is uh, cabbage this is uh, the patient immediately post operatively up and about this gentleman had uh, uh, his mvr done 3 years back and uh, the gentleman on the right side had uh, the avr done and he is sitting in my clinic on the fourth post operative day uh, some tumors like alamyxomas can also be uh, extracted by this approach you can see clearly we are uh, resecting the alamyxoma this lady uh, she was a 16 years old girl presented with with, with uh, alamyxoma this is the asd patient so what is the evidence so far seven prospective randomized controlled trials have been done on the aortic valve three rcts on the mitral valve surgery the rcts reveal that the minimal invasive techniques are associated with fewer wound infections faster mobilization without any difference in survival colin galway showed equal in marker protection decreased pain less blood and few wound complications better cosmetic results shorter hospital stay and equivalent five year results this is some of the data the concept of hybrid revascularization hybrid revascularization combines uh, minimal invasive cabbage uh, with the lima to led and pc of the non led vessels uh, there are some observational data from the first multi centric uh, study by john puskos uh, which says that there is no significant difference in mace result uh, rates over 12 months between patients treated with multi vessel pci or hybrid revascularization which is an emerging modality so what should be done and what should not be done while doing while developing the minimal invasive cardiac surgery program first of all as uh, dr uh, parvez jodi said that it's just like the same surgery there's no difference in it and uh, uh, the same principles apply train your team build your team train your anesthetist train your perfusionist who's the key person train your assistants then take a very good informed consent and also you have to cover cover up your legal aspects in this uh, uh, also avoid extreme an, uh, anatomy in the very beginning very flat chest and tiny patients and consider the cost you do not have to be fanatic about this do not be egoistic that i have to do this if any patient any complications occurs or you feel or you're struggling just cut it open and convert it into the open stenotomy don't compromise the quality of repair for the draw of less invasive cardiac surgery so what are the lessons which have been learned an inexperienced surgeon is unable to transit swiftly to this approach any surgeon who is experienced and has been dealing with different sorts of complications and doing complex work he adapts more easily than what he what he uh, actually thinks build your team start with easy and straightforward cases initially don't hesitate to convert rather than compromising the patient local and global alliance industry support and proctorship which is very important why to do why not to do and why i do the question arises why on earth are we troubling ourselves with the headache of innovation because it is here to stay and is the present and future it is developing into the new gold standard technology is changing and the patients are changing too they expect less invasive 
cardiac surgical techniques with expeditious results. It's a good challenge for growth and self-improvisation. Medicine is constant flux, striving to help without harming. It provides fewer complications and faster recovery in most cases. It allows customization of patient's treatment, which is no longer one size fits all. It's a good platform for synergy with the cardiologist within the, uh, within the MDT meetings. It is what I would hope to receive for myself or my family in a similar situation. And also, it is our duty as surgeons and academics to seek better solutions and stand for controversy and discussion, as well as teach and facilitate for others to follow. And the other question is, why not to do this minimal invasive cardiac surgery? Because it's not expensive at all. It is not as traumatic as a classical surgery is. It is not difficult at all. And it is not experimental. The conclusion is, minimal invasive surgery is a great opportunity and is not a threat for our profession. It can help us provide an edge for our high-tech healthcare system without colliding with the principles of value-driven outcomes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Yasser. Um, so, carrying on with the same uh, topic, I would request uh, Dr. Haris Bilal, please, if you can come over. Then we take this. Sounds good. First of all, I'd like to thank uh, Dr. Tariq, uh, Dr. Shahkar, and the whole team at PIC for this wonderful opportunity of being here, being able to do a live case uh, mid-cap. And uh, uh, it's, it's an honor and pleasure uh, to have another five minutes just to discuss our experience at Shifa International. So I work as a consultant cardiac surgeon at Shifa. At the same time, I hold a chair at Manchester Met and Manchester Royal Infirmary. One of the reasons I feel extremely honored being at this society is my father, uh, Colonel Bilal Yusuf, was one of the founding members in 1981 who established this society. And when I first came to Pakistan, I said, well, there's no good society. And he said to me, we do have a society, and I'm one of the founding members, so you better go and uh, uh, be part of it. So uh, one of the reasons uh, I've I moved to MidCab mid is pretty much explained by uh, Dr. Pravez Chaudhary and Dr. Khakwani brilliantly. So we initially started with lateral MidCab nearly four years ago, and we used a left lateral thoracotomy for most of our incisions. And over the period of time of the last couple of years, we've moved more towards uh, an interior approach through a low interior hemisternotomy. All the procedures that we've performed through mid-cab, other than a couple of them, have been on beating hearts. Uh, I'll just go through the interior. We've uh, seen lateral. There are plenty of YouTube videos. There's plenty of people doing it in the country. So I'll just go through the interior mid-cab and how I do it uh, at Shifa. We don't use any fancy instruments. We don't use any fancy retractors. Everything we use and everything we used in Peshawar a couple of days ago are local Pakistani instruments. We make around a five to six centimeter midline incision and go through the fourth intercostal space in a T-shape. Skeletonize uh, the lima, especially we're going to go for sequential grafts. We call it the Nadim Gil retractor. He found me a real old retractor uh, from somewhere in the store and we've been using it ever since for the last uh, couple of hundred cases. We open the pericardium all the way down to the IVC by using one of the peanuts that was devised by one of my colleagues uh, who's still here as well. We completely open the right pleura, allowing full mobilization of the heart. Uh, instruments, exactly the same. You don't need your hospital to buy you expensive stuff. You don't need any fancy retractors. You don't need special lights. A simple headlight is more than enough. Uh, till date, uh, We've done nearly 236 mid-cap procedures. We started with lateral mid-cap, so we have a higher number. And even for the lateral mid-cap, we're using a completely off-pump approach. And uh, we do multi-vessel grafting. And as soon as we've moved to the interior mid-cap, 
we've kind of gone out uh, more away from the hybrid coronary revascular. In lateral mid-cap, we've got a significant number of hybrid cases as well that I'll just go quickly go through. I'll just very quickly go through the video. If uh, some of you have missed it in our live case and how we do it, play uh, it. So the way we go about it is uh, just skin marking. Uh, once you've marked the skin, we mark exactly five centimeter incision in the lower half, and that is pretty much uh, all you need. If you can't cut the Z fee, I wasn't able to show in the live case, all you can do is make a small hole for the drain at the bottom and use a blunt scissors to cut the Z fee. Do a T-shaped hemistronotomy at the bottom and uh, just do hemostasis like we normally do. There's nothing different about it. In the beginning, the cut looks a bit small, but as you start opening the sternum, it gets bigger and bigger. This is what we use a peanut to completely mobilize the heart, regardless of which territory you need. LED, OM, PDA, you can access intermediate. We've done up to five to six grafts through this approach, and we routinely perform three grafts. That's the retractor I didn't have in Peshawar because of the last minute delay, uh, but it's one of those uh, sling things, and a single retractor comes down. Uh, single shaft comes down and you can gently pull it up. It's available in Pakistan via Meditools from Sialkot. And then you can just do your uh, lima harvesting like you'd normally do. Uh, the top half is a bit difficult, so I routinely put a port at the site of uh, drain incision and we dissect the memory all the way up to the first intercostal space. And there's never been a point where we've never been able to uh, dissect the memory completely. We use our normal ligaclip clip applicators, so you don't need any Ethicon special applicators to do it. And you can get a full complete harvesting of lima all the way to the first intercostal space like we did uh, a couple of days ago. The coronary anastomoses are performed exactly in the same way using some wet swabs and you can access all territories regardless of uh, uh, where the lesions are. So all patients are eligible and as long as they've got an EF of more than 35 to 40%, we go through it. We routinely perform sequential grafting of lemurs, we perform sequential grafting of radials. And one of the benefits of using the anterior approach is you can give patients a complete revask as compared to required for hybrid. At the end, the incision is not going to be more than 2.25 inches. And then you've got a satisfied patient who goes home by day three. And I believe the patient that we did uh, live is going home today. So this is the third day of the conference. So I feel quite a success for the patient. Uh, next slide. So that's our numbers for anterior and lateral med cabs. Uh, so we've moved more towards anterior mid-cap over the last couple of years. We've done 105 cases. The Lima usage, we've missed one patient with left internal memory artery because of damage and had to use a radial artery. The average number of grafts is higher in the uh, anterior mid-cap group as compared to the lateral. We've had no conversions. We've had one pump assist case in the lateral mid-cap. Uh, the mean Euroscore obviously remains low as we're highly selective for these cases. Uh, just going through the numbers in terms of mortality, we've had two mortalities in the anterior mid-cap group, one, both one because of renal failure and the second one due to multi-organ failure. The re-explorations in the anterior mid-cap group is quite low. We've had two, uh, three re-explorations in the lateral mid-cap and all three of them were from the proximal anastomosis. So as I go through the learning curve, I learn the most difficult bit is actually doing the proximal anastomosis and the hemostasis through it. Uh, that's the average length of stay. ICU stay pretty much the same for both the groups. I'll just skip through this one. So hybrid revask amongst the lateral mid-cap group. Uh, we've had 35 patients who were planned before surgery, gone through our MDT, and have had hybrid revascularization. I had the honor to present to the Cardiocon this year as well. So the average number of grafts in these patients were one or two, and subsequently these patients ended up with a PCI on day four following surgery. Um, at the time of repeat revas, we had uh, uh, f five of our vein grafts had gone down, uh, but alhamdulillah, all of our left internal memory arteries were patent. Uh, at patients where the vein grafts had gone down, uh, they had PCI at the same time. So in terms of learning curve and evolution and anybody who wants to do it and how to do it, I think use cardiopulmonary bypass if you don't routinely uh, do off-pump surgery. Take time to harvest Lima, and I think as uh, 
my colleagues will tell you that's probably the most difficult bit in terms of uh, getting through the initial stages. The proximal anastomosis is where you would get into trouble, and that's the most difficult bit because we're so used to doing uh, the distals like routinely off pump. But proximal anastomosis, I always uh, kind of say to a lot of people who've come and watched, uh, once you've done your proximal anastomosis, please take four extra stitches, adventitial stitches, in all four corners with the 7.0 proline. That will save you the re-explorations. All the re-explorations I've had or problems I've had has normally been the proximal anastomosis. Avoid patients with EF below 40%. Avoid diffuse and calcified coronary arteries. Uh, octopus is your best friend, whether you're doing a lateral mid-cab or interior mid-cab, especially, uh, especially when you're exposing the proximal anastomosis and the aorta. So use the octopus to suppress the PA. Use the octopus to suppress the right ventricular outflow tract, and it wouldn't cause any hemodynamic compromise as long as your anesthetist is on board with you. Um, Evolution, we started with lateral. I've moved more towards interior, and the reason for that is cost. In lateral, doing it in a private sector, if you're doing a hybrid revast, it costs the patient around 1.8 million rupees if you're having done it shifar, nearly 1.2 1, 1 million for cabbage, and then another 600,000 rupees for uh, your uh, PCI. So it is costly, but if the patient really doesn't want a scar in the middle and wants a lateral mid-cab and you want to go for hybrid and they are affording, I will still go for a lateral mid-cab. But interior mid-cab, one of the reasons I kind of fell in love with it over the last couple of years is lack of pain. As soon as you take the drains out, all the patients now we do, regardless of their age, we extubate them on table for multiple reasons. I know a lot of phenesthetists will come back to me and say to me, Harris, fast tracking for five to six hours doesn't make a huge difference if you extubate them on table. But for various logistical reasons at my hospital, what we do is inject nearly 20 to 25 mils, just we did at PIC the other day, of local anesthetic, and especially in the drain sites, and we extubate them on table, get them on HDU the next day, and try to get them home on day three. Uh, so one of the main things that I've kind of moved slightly away from lateral, so if I do four anterior mid-cabs, I'll do one lateral mid-cab, is because of the pain itself. Uh, there have been a few patients where we've used cryotherapy in terms of uh, absolutely buzzing the intercostal arteries and lateral mid-cabs, but patient still has some pain around the costal margins, as we're aware. Uh, anterior mid-cab will give you a complete revask. You can do the distal RCA, you can do proximal RCA, you can do the PDA, you can do pretty much all the territories once you've gone through the cycle of the first 50 cases. It is very close to our conventional cabbage. If you run into trouble, it's only going to take you another couple of minutes and you can open the whole chest and go on bypass if required. Um, it's easier to perform. In terms of key learning points that I've kind of gone through and say to everyone, the most important thing, when I first came to Shiva, nobody was doing off pumps. So the first six months, we never did a med cab while I was routine, routinely doing them in Manchester. So first and foremost thing is develop your team. Develop people around you that you can trust. Develop people who've got the skills to help you open the chest, go on bypass. And most importantly, please get your anesthetist on board. Please get your anesthetic team to buy into this program. Like Dr. Chaudhary said it's really important to have people who you can trust around you. When I moved from Manchester to Shifa, it took me nearly six months to find and identify the people that I could work with, and now we've got a team that just works like a dream. Four days ago, we came to Peshawar. We were told we were doing a mid-cap. I had all of them together with me, and despite anything else, with the perfect anesthetic support, we were able to do three grafts uh, uh, at the spot. Develop your team. Support from anesthesia is key. It is reproducible. You can do it. It just takes the first 25 cases of learning curve. Once you've gone over that, anybody can do it. It's got lower morbidity and lower mortality. And uh, thank you. That's our picture from following our live cases, three grafts at PIC. I have to say a special thanks to our anesthetist, Dr. Shavana and Dr. Anwar, I think, what was uh, head of anesthesia. He was brilliant. Dr. Ashraf, absolutely brilliant, fantastic, the support we had at PIC for the live case and subsequently the way they've looked after it. And uh, it's been an absolute honor and pleasure and thank you very much all. Thank you. Thank you so much. And uh, <clears throat> uh, just uh, we can take a couple of questions. 
so it was mix and then lateral and then interior so within the mix there are further groups subgroups uh, dr asim <coughs> Uh, thank you so much, Professor Parvez Choudhury, uh, Dr. Khakwani, and Dr. Yasser Saab. Uh, indeed, MEX is the future, uh, and it is present. We all are uh, struggling with it and uh, trying to develop in our under-resourced country. My question is, uh, yes, um, and in my understanding, the lower astronomy is actually the culprit in, in all this median astronomy. Uh, if you can pro avoid the lower astronomy, which is actually the lever action of the uh, costal, uh, um, uh, the, the subcostal area, abdomen, and the ribs itself. When you are even bowing a little, you are actually exerting a lot of pressure. And uh, um, again, cartilages are more worthier. So, upper minister not me, cabbage, not possible. Lower minister not me, cabbage. But again, the same problem, the part that we want to avoid is actually we are cutting the same part. Dr. So Harris, you want I, to respond to that? I wanted to ask about that. That's a great question. So uh, I don't know how, who told you that lower uh, sternum has, carries all the weight. So I don't think that's true. First of all, the important bit that you're cutting in the lower hemisternotomy is not the sternum, much of it. So if you'd seen in the live case, all we did was put one wire so the amount of sternum that you cut is less than an inch. So if you've got a sternum that's nearly 12, 10 or 11 uh, inches or something like, say, 7 inches, so if you cut 1 inch of the sternum and you have a 2.25 centimeter skin incision, I can assure you, you can go and see that elderly lady. Uh, she was extubated on the table and she'd be home on day 3 with minimal or no pain. Well, in terms of uh, what, what bothers us about the full sternotomy and patients were smokers in Pakistan, diabetic patients, the wound healing. Most of that tends to start and happen and has catastrophic uh, events when you've got the upper half and most of the sternum out of it. So in terms of this group that I've been doing, and I can really assure you that this is the data and you will see it as you go and do it yourself, uh, the pain is non-existent, number one. Second, you don't get deep sternal wound infections. Uh, there is actually no way you'll have the whole sternum involved with the wound infection. So what I've had the worst bit of wound infection was a colleague of mine and I did her mother and uh, she had a bit of a ooze. By day three I could see the wire, we put a vac pump on it, within a week we were able to close the wound. So in terms of pain uh, from the lateral, I've always thought the interior is much better because there is no thoracotomy. And even if you're doing lateral, I would strongly suggest there are com a couple of companies who sell this cryoablation device, and I can give you the name. So as soon as you finish, and you can use the same device for a good 25, 30 cases by re-sterilizing it, as long as you buzz the intercostal uh, nerve, these patients will be pretty uh, comfortable. But the only thing with the lateral, once you've done the cryoablation, is that these patients will never have any sensation on those parts ever again. So they'll always complain a bit of numbness. But I think the, 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 my understanding and the way I felt it ever was, uh, once you've cut the manubrium, the second, third intercostal space, the clavicle going on towards your sternum, that's when you uh, get into trouble with pain or complications after a sternotomy. So but yes, uh, if, if you think I can find your way without cutting the side of the chest and without cutting the front of the chest, you need to find a good cardiologist. Dr. Zubair. Yeah, so uh, just at Harris's point about uh, cryoneurolysis. So um, in our program, we are regularly doing cryoneurolysis for all the <coughs> mini mitrals and uh, for mini cabbages as well. So Atricure makes very good probes. Um, and we normally we do, uh, the protocol is uh, for us is to minus 60 degrees centigrade and just for a minute. And it gives us uh, about six months of no pain at all and then slowly they get the sensation back. Within a period of about anywhere between three to six months, the sensations do come back. Uh, but in our, uh, especially the work done by Edmonton Group, we have seen that uh, it causes uh, controlled valerian degeneration 
and we have very good results with, since we have started using cryoneurolysis. So for Dr. Zubair, I'm sure there is no added cost to your thing because it doesn't bother yeah, you that's, there. That's but so the, uh, Harris, I think, I, I'm pretty sure the cost does so affect your procedures for there us, at uh, No, f we, we, have, we had our struggle. So uh, the way it works for us was that actually the pediatric surgery team, mm -hmm. they twisted the arm of uh, the regional health authority because uh, they were doing practice. And the practice kids always get tremendous amount of pain. Oh, yeah. So yeah. when they started using cryoneurolysis, the results were so dramatic that the regional authority actually had to purchase it. And then we kind of, you know, wiggled our way into getting those probes at our place. Mm -hmm. uh, but the probe itself is very costly. Yeah. Um, it costs around seven hundred, uh, sorry, seventeen hundred dollars for a single probe. So okay. seventeen hundred Canadian dollars uh, for that. Um, the generator actually is uh, on loan always, but they make so much money. So how much is it costing? So can uh, I just is? talk about the cost very quickly for the mid cabin Pakistan, just very quickly. So I've calculated in terms of hospital stay, in terms of the cost of surgery itself, an interior or a lateral mid cap patient, if they go home on day three or the morning of day four, the total cost in terms of consumables and everything is 32,000 rupees. How much? 32,000 rupees. Three seven O's, two six O's, sternal wires, three drains, endotracheal tube, that's five and a half thousand rupees and a central line. So if you can get a patient home within 33,000 rupees with even a tiny bit of pain and if you don't use the probe, I still think it's a big win-win and it's a success for our economy. So, so how and much is added for the probe to that 32,000? So the probe is, uh, we've got a probe from a company that makes it uh, basically in Taiwan. And they supply it to some of the orthopedic surgeons and the, some of the plastic surgeons. They're using it for various reasons. I can give you the name of the company. So I've only got one probe and I think it's my 50th case or something with the same probe. So we just re-sterilize it. And the octopus that we use from the Medtronic one, on an average at Shifa International, we're using it for 45 to 50 cases. So the cost is 170,000 rupees divided by 50. That's 3,000 rupees per patient. So if you can do a surgery in this day and age in less than 50,000 rupees in terms of consumables, I think that's a no-brainer. Dr. Imran, sir, any uh, comments, please? Yeah, just, uh, Tariq, I've got a question. Sir, please. Sir. Yeah, sure. Paris, Dr. Mazur Rahman from Lahore. Uh, thank you very much for uh, this minimal invasive business. I think as a surgeon, uh, we need to understand all conventional cardiac surgery, sternotomy, I think the whole idea of uh, minimal access surgery was to avoid sternotomy so that we remove the danger of mediastinitis. You know, if you do any approach, either left, right, right into your thoracotomy, mid-cap, anything, the risk of mediastinitis goes zero. Okay? I know minimal access is upper sternotomy. Yes, it is a lower sternotomy. Um, all these approaches are there, but the approaches which are non-stenotomy <coughs> are the ones which remove the risk of mediastinitis, even if it's small, even if it's zero, if it's a one. That's one thing. And I appreciate learning and training is easier with partial stenotomies, either up or lower, which can be replicable by, I think, a lot of our junior colleagues as well. The most important task is to establish the coronary artery surgery through the med cap. I know it's pain for the patient and the surgeon as well, of course, uh, uh, but that's a way forward if we can develop the whole uh, team and the technology with, with the safety, that's one thing. The other question, I was very surprised with the one, cent, one inch cut of sternotomy with the lower sternotomy. So which one inch of the sternum do you cut? Do you include the uh, Zephy, no Zephy, or what? So basically, I don't include Zephy in the sternum at all. So Zephy is not a bone that's part of the cartilage. So sure. what you can do is, if I could show you again, that's called Zephy sternum. That's so exactly. So yeah. it's cartilaginous yeah. part of the part sternum. sternum. So yeah. So I'm not going to go into the details of no, the no, cartilage sure, but bit. I just but I think as long as you, so if I'm not doing the right coronary artery, so I would stay in the fifth intercostal space. So we'd go in the fifth intercostal space, cut it, make a T. An inch, an inch and a half of the sternum, that is more than enough for you to get enough excess for the aorta for your proximal anastomosis. 
If you're doing the right, in, uh, right coronary artery, you need more than two proximal anastomoses. You can go into the fourth intercostal space. In terms of mediastinitis and the risk of wound infection, I think there are certain basic principles that I follow, and we've done it over the last uh, uh, six years as a consultant in Manchester Royal Infirmary and now two years here and we've not had a single mediastinitis. So I'll tell you three things that we do in theatre that has reduced the risk of infection, whether it's lateral mid-cab and anterior mid-cab. Number one, and we spoke about it in PIC in Lahore as well. Number one, none of our instruments that are going to be used for sternal closure are ever opened or brought from CSSD to theatre until protamine is given. Number one, at the time of protamine administration, the whole team will change their gloves. Number two, that's what reduces your risk of infection. Number three, uh, and, and most importantly, what I, I, there is no evidence for it, but using regular topical vancomycin really helps. In the, I think t in terms of my total numbers of two, nearly touching 250, not having a single mediastinitis and deep sternal wound infection keeps me quite reassured. I'm sure one day I'm going to have a deep sternal wound infection or a mediastinitis. And when you say mediastinitis, you're talking about the interior mediastinum getting involved by the infection. So even if you're doing a lateral mid-cab, you are exposing the interior mediastinum to the outside world. So I don't think that's exactly true anatomically speaking, that you can't get a mediastinitis with a lateral mid-cab. Uh, you can get it because mediastinum is the area behind the sternum. Uh, but uh, listen, whatever works for you. I do lateral mid-cabs. Uh, I routinely do lateral mid-cabs, but there are limitations to lateral mid-cabs. And one of the main limitations is the right coronary artery in terms of grafting. We are a heavily right-dominant society. So if you look at it, you rarely see a patient without right coronary artery having disease. Then you're dependent upon your cardiologist for hybrid revask. But you can still do it, but it's really difficult doing a distal right through the left chest. So uh, that works for me. Thank you. I, I think the very interesting comment you made about this changing things. The so we'll take the uh, yes. comment from uh, Dr. Pravesh Chaudhary. Uh, just a quick comment. Can you, uh, can you please uh, name, you mentioned it two, three times, and I'm looking for that cryoprobe. And I would like to have the name of that. But coming back to your talk, uh, as I stated in my talk, you have to do what you are comfortable with. But stating that it's not doable from that incision, that is not a correct statement. I do up to six grafts, minimally invasive, through that lateral. I presented, if you go into ISMIC in 19, uh, 2017 at Rome, I presented how you can do it just with one octopus. But if you are do, uh, using your evolution, that old octopus, it's difficult to reach the right or the PDA. I use NUO and I use it sub xiphoid. I have never made an incision. And the idea behind that is not that how much pain that patient felt for one few days. The idea is how strong can you tell him that after even half the sternum, I don't know, out of one inch uh, mm, sternum, just like Mother mentioned, you can have to get to the fourth intercostal, but more power to you what you are doing. But the issue is all of those grafts are done, able to do it, and especially if you have a cryoprobe. Cryoprobe, 90 days, you can check it on the dot. When you, the day you block the nerves, to 90 days, your wound will be all healed and their sensation will come back. I will get you the name. And Dr. Uh, Imran Asher for comment, please. I'll get you the name. I think whether you do laterally, whether you do anteriorly, you do a trans-auxiliary approach, you do a second intercostal space. As long as you can avoid heart-lung machine, you can do it on a beating heart, you don't have stroke. I think minimally invasive, it's not just the incision itself. If you're using a heart-lung machine, if you're putting the patient on bypass, you're cross-clamping, you're giving a plegia, and then you're doing four, five, or six, or even seven grafts, I think that's, uh, you can call it minimally invasive because my cut was on the left side of the chest, but if you can do it through a two inches incision from the front or the side without using heart-lung machine, uh, within 50,000 rupees in Pakistan, I'm quite happy with it. So, How are you counting the cost making it to... So, uh, I think that, I think the number... I think that 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 the
Okay, so can we have that calculation at the tree break and uh, we have to move forward uh, and we sort out the nitty gritty and charge each other then. Uh, sir. Thank you very much. अगर आप ये देखें ना कि अगर कोई छोटा सा पोर्शन भी हम स्टर्नम का बचा लेते हैं वाइल डूइंग मिड स्टर्नोटमी तो वो जो स्प्लिंट फैक्टर आता है ना उसकी वजह से भी आपकी मीडिया स्टाइनाइटिस और बाकी चीजें काफी कम हो जाती हैं तो जितना भी स्टर्नम बचे चाहे वो आधी मनुब्रियम ही बच जाए that is beneficial. Uh, definitely. Plus, he's a member of the US of that. All right. So, we move on. How long do you advise your patient for a bed rest after this uh, a hemisternotomy? Off work. Off work. There, there is no bed rest. They can and lift weight. So, they can lift weight. They can go straight back to work. So, up, up, uh, aim is that you have to send them to the house. Okay? Or the fourth maximum will go. 90% patients go, I'm scared, 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 I'm scared. In terms of getting back to their normal activities, pretty much the same time. We've not had any instability because of somebody's walking or running or lifting weights. If you think about it, I, I, don't, I don't know how, how to explain it to you. So, let's say 80%, 70% of your sternum intact, you should take weight. It's not going to cause any harm. We've not had any instability in these patients whatsoever. So our next debate will be interior versus lateral thoracotomy in the next conference next year in Sakha. And I move on to, uh, because we have a lot of people are leaving and they have their flight scheduled, right? So apologies if I can't uh, take too many questions. I would like uh, Dr. Soha Zaberi now to present on short and midterm outcomes of sequential grafting in a developing nation. Be quick. Assalamualaikum. Uh, my name is Soha Zaberi, and I'll be presenting upon the comparative analysis of sequential versus non-sequential coronary artery grafting. So I have no conflict of interest. So this is uh, an Argentinian cardiac surgeon uh, who was Dr. Rene Fevolaro, and in the on the 9th May 1967. He performed the first documented cephalous vein grafting in a in a 50-year-old female. He published one of his most famous volumes, that's the surgical treatment of coronary arteriosclerosis. And soon in his practice, he started sequential grafting. So the reason he started sequential grafting was because of two main reasons. There was shortage of venous grafts, and there was the, he wanted to reduce the manipulation of the diseased ascending aorta. So this, this approach also aimed to enhance the utilization of the arterial conduits. So here's a picture of sequential grafting. So the first picture is the parallel sequential grafting, whereas the second is the diamond or the oblique sequential grafting. So the rationale behind this study is that we f might face limitations on the number of conduits. So for example, if the patient has varicose veins, so we want to do a more smarter and a technical approach that is the sequential grafting. Uh, it increases the use of arteries on the target coronaries and it enhances the graft longevity through using arterial conduits. So we compare our outcomes of sequential versus non-sequential. So the advocates of this uh, sequential grafting, they say that it allows for efficient use of single graft to bypass multiple coronaries, maximizing the utility of the available resources. Supporters of this approach, they also they say that the, there, are, there is a hemodynamic benefit resulting from total enhanced graft flow, leading to improved distal runoff and consequently higher rates of graft patency. It minimizes the need for additional incisions and sites for graft harvesting, and it in, uh, minimizes the manipulation of the aorta in the elderly and the patients with heavily calcified aortas. So utilizing advanced and efficient techniques to perform more arterial grafts using smaller arterial conduits. So the opponents say that it's a more technically challenging procedure compared to the traditional signal graphs, com and this complexity could increase the risk of surgical complications and the operating time. Disadvantages of increased conduit manipulation, suboptimal conduit lie, or in certain cases, there's an intricacy of certain side-to-side -side anastomosis. The primary drawback, however, is 
uh, the concern of the surgeons that they say that the significant portion of the myocardium could face jeopardy in, in, uh, in the event of proximal occlusion or steel syndrome. So it is a retrospective cohort study that we did on 217 patients in a time frame of five years from 2019 to 2023 at South, South City Hospital. We did file reviews, telephone re interviews, and analyzed the data using SPSS 23. So we used the Seattle Angina questionnaire and the MACE score, that's the major adverse cardiac events in patients with chest pain. Talking about the results, the conduits used in sequential drafting were great cephalous vein and the radial and the lima archi. So lima was used in 131 patients, whereas 43 patients used, we used radial archi, and 187 patients we used the great cephalous vein. If we talk about the um, comparative analysis of how the outcomes differed, so there was a more risk of SSIs and pneumonia in sequential grafting as compared to morta uh, mortality and need for revas that we saw more in the subset of non-sequential. The total vibe of how, how we say that there's more operating time and increased surgical time in the non-sequential as compared to sequential, the data shows something else. The total bypass time was uh, around 96 minutes in the, uh, in 46, around 96 minutes in the sequential versus around 70 minutes in the non-sequential. That shows that they, it took less time to do a non-sequential as compared to sequential. So now the question arises that is our literature comparable to international resources? So it is. So my parent study was Ozanian et al. in which we saw that were the, we, there was a similar trend in, in hospital mortality, surgical side infections, the total cross clamp and bypass time was much lesser with Dr. Shahid Sami's data as compared to the Ozonian at all. Whereas if we see the readmission for cardiac causes, that was significantly lesser in our population. That was 13% for the sequential, whereas there was 31% of not, uh, non-sequential in the Ozanian at all. Whereas if we talk about the sequential, there was readmission of 28.7% as compared to 4% in our population. So if you talk about the studies that have been done throughout the world, Mohammed at all in his study suggested that opting for sequential grafting is more favorable when compared to repeated bypass grafting as it leads to a more even flow and reduced spatial gradients in the wall shear stress. Jun Park et al. in their studies stated that when cephalous vein grafts were sequentially used to bypass both the LCX and the RCA territories, their patency was better than the individual cephalous vein grafts used to bypass only the RCA territory. However, individual SVGs used to bypass the LCX territory demonstrated patency levels that were similar to those of sequential grafts. He also stated that new intermal hyperplasia is a widely recognized as the, uh, it's a primary factor responsible for early vein graft failure, typically occurring 24 months post-surgery. Post so previous studies have indicated that lower vascular resistance improves distal runoff, and higher flow velocities in sequential bypass graft are also associated with the reduced new intermal hyperplasia. So in conclusion, this is one of its kind first, surgery, first report that's uh, published, in, uh, not yet published, it's an ongoing research in Pakistan. And the study suggests potential benefits of sequential grafting yielding favorable outcomes by reval revask of more coronary arteries by alleviating late angina symptoms. So the choice of surgical technique should be tailored to patients' needs. The research contributes valuable insights for healthcare decision makers considering sequential grafting in Pakistani context. Limitations include a single surgeon, experience with lack of follow-up angiograms and stress testing. So here I would like to show you, this is a patient of us, 17 years post-operatively, in which we can see there's lima to mid LED, side to side anastomosis that was patent, and lima to distal LED, dist end to side anastomosis that was patent as well. These are my references, thank you so much. And I'm sorry I had to rush it because Dr. Sami has to catch a flight right now. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you. All right, uh, I had a big uh, burden down my head now. So, okay, so I just wait there for your questions to be answered at the end of the session. And Dr. Sammi, if you have to leave, you can. Uh, you, I don't want you to miss your flight. Thank you so much for being here, and thank, thank you. Uh, next is. Um,
again a rescheduled talk because of uh, the flight schedules uh, for Dr. Thayyip Pasha and that is uh, propensity matched analysis of SPG and radial artery grafts in cabbage long term follow up. Assalamualaikum. Tarek, thank you uh, very much uh, for accommodating me. Uh, I am Dr. Tayyip Pasha and uh, running a cardiac surgery program at a very small unit. It's not Aga Khan Medical University, it's not NICVD or PIC. But the beautiful thing is that we started the database from the very beginning. So it's only seven bedded uh, department. Uh, but uh, trying to do all the things according to the international standards. Uh, we develop a STS database uh, by local vendors, by paying 25, 5,000 in 2006 and 7, and then we keep on improving and now we're having STS database uh, 2.72 uh, version uh, uh, and it's uh, uh, accessible online as well. Uh, we are doing, uh, we have evolved with the passage of time. Uh, now we are doing, uh, my default strategy for coronary artery bypass surgery is off-pump coronary artery bypass surgery and uh, maximum use of uh, multiple arterial grafts if it's possible. Uh, at one stage of my life, I was doing around about 50% of uh, my uh, off-pump surgery with the multiple use of arterial grafts. Uh, here, uh, I'm going to present uh, this. Uh, uh, data is only from the public hospital, which is a very small uh, center. Uh, here, uh, we have done uh, more than 2,000 uh, open heart procedures including congenital heart surgery, aortic dissections, and uh, most of the things, uh, with an uh, overall uh, crude mortality of around about 4%, including everything, and uh, less than 2% mortality for coronary artery bypass surgery. Uh, total number of patients uh, in coronary artery bypass surgery uh, uh, were more than 1,000 and out of these around about 25 percent was uh, radial artery grafts. Uh, mean duration of follow-up uh, for the, it was a telephonic uh, follow-up. We have got a data analyst uh, for a, you know, uh, for telef uh, telephonic uh, follow-up. And uh, we used uh, uh, quality of life, uh, you know, WHO recommended uh, performer. Uh, which uh, have uh, 25 subsets, and we added few uh, more subsets to that. I'm going to show you. Uh, this is a quality of uh, life performer, uh, and we added uh, rate of revascularization, use of medicine, uh, rate of rehospitalization. I'm going to show. Uh, you can look at this is the you know. Survival rate uh, after radial artery versus septicemic graft uh, during uh, cap surgery. Uh, I will take you further. Uh, this is a time to e event uh, analysis. Actually, I was lucky to have the help of my colleague, uh, professor of community medicine, uh, to run all that of uh, all sort of uh, statistical analysis, and that's a wonderful help. And you can see clearly uh, the uh, survival in cabbage using a radial graft compared to the surface graft is better. And this difference is stat statistically significant with a p-value of 0 0.023. <laughs> uh, it's a real data and it's an honest data uh, for follow-up. Uh, and the mean duration of uh, radial artery grafts is 94 months. And the mean duration of, uh, for the surface vein graft is 84 months. Uh, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, propensity match in a while. Uh, before that, we divided our patients in three groups, uh, uh, depending on the age, ejection fraction, and diabetes. Uh, this is the, you see, uh, very important slide. I, I'm, uh, this is a patient with a lesser, uh, less than 50 uh, years of age. As you can see, uh, the significant survival advantage with the use of radial artery as compared to the septum graft. 
and, uh, and these are relatively adult patients, more than 50 years of age. So this is the real data is showing us the survival in younger patients with the use of multiple arterial grafts is better as compared to the uh, uh, elderly population. And uh, this is again uh, survival pattern according to the ejection fraction. I'll come to that. This is a very interesting slide too. You see the survival is less uh, in a low ejection fraction group, uh, which was a significant number in our study, uh, I think more than 100, uh, 150, uh, close to 150. You see the survival is less in uh, uh, in ejection fraction less than 35%. And there was no difference between the use of a radial graft and a separate graft in low ejection fraction, at least in our analysis. But in uh, ejection fraction more than 35%, you can see there is a rare, uh, clear advantage of, uh, with the use of the radial artigraphs. And this is the survival pattern according to the ejection fraction. You can see and can And uh, you know, third group is the uh, diabetic patients. So uh, similarly in the di diabetic patient, there was a, a clear advantage of, uh, you know, uh, survival benefit with the use of uh, multiple arterial graphs. Uh, we done another Cox regression analysis on the same set. Uh, one was the time to event analysis, other one the Cox regression analysis. It's also supporting the same uh, hypothesis. And this is an adjusted model. Now I'm coming to the propensity score analysis. Uh, for purpose score analysis, uh, you know, uh, there are some criteria. We have to fulfill that criteria because uh, these are the uh, retrospective and observation studies. So uh, by doing propensity match analysis, uh, uh, we were able to contact uh, 117 out of 190 patients for surface wearing graft and uh, 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 around about uh, uh, 91 patients out of uh, 102 patients for the radiology graphs, and the duration of follow-up is around about uh, 95 months for radiology graphs, and it's around about 84 months for the uh, surface wave graft. Mortality in the propensity match cohort of surface wave graft was 16.23%. And uh, then the mortality in the radial artery graft, this is in, uh, according to the propensity match analysis, is around about 14.8%. Uh, stroke was 0% in both the, you know, and the revascularization uh, among the propensity match, this is an uh, aspect where we need to address, you know. Uh, the rate of revascularization is very low, uh, but I think I need to look into it again uh, from follow-up point of view. Uh, but. Clearly, you see that the good thing is that we, we are having a long-term data and long-term outcome and long-term outcome with the use of multiple uh, uh, graphs, either the radial graphs or the other arterial graphs, is much better, particularly in a younger population with good ejection fraction and in diabetic. So this is uh, the center message of uh, abstract is that a comparison uh, between vein grafts and the serrated graft in coronary artery bypass grafting procedure uh, indicates potentially better long term survival with the use of RTA grafts. Uh, it's, uh, you know, supportive uh, from the meta analysis point of view. You know, all the meta analysis which have been carried out for the comparing uh, RTA graft with the venous graft. Uh, they are supportive of uh, long-term survival advantage, but the, still we are unable to produce the result in the randomized trial. Uh, this is real-time data and real-time data from Pakistan, and uh, 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 I'm blessed and uh, uh, feeling encouraged that uh, use of multiple arterial graft will improve long-term survival in our population. Thank you very much. Any question? Well, uh, 
So just for the sake of uh, you know saving some time, uh, we'll move on to the talks first, and then we'll take questions at the end. Uh, our next presenter is Prakriti uh, Rame uh, from AFIC, and his talk will be on our experience of minimal invasive cardiac surgery at AFIC. Uh, thank you for the organizers for inviting us uh, for this conference and I uh, will uh, share our experience with minimally invasive cardiac surgery at AFIC and IHD. Uh, over the past few decades it's already been discussed that uh, minimally invasive cardiac surgery has emerged as an accepted approach for the management of cardiac surgical diseases. The growth of MICS has been driven in part by major improvements in the technology combined with a desire by both by the surgeon and the patients for minimally invasive approaches to the treatment of cardiac diseases that requires a surgical solution. As already been discussed that in 2008 a scientific statement from American Heart Association defined minimally invasive cardiac surgery as cardiac surgery performed through a chest, small chest wall incision that does not include a conventional full stenotomy. And uh, MICS has gained consensus among surgeons as it has provided greater um, patient satisfaction while maintaining the same quality and safety of the traditional cardiac surgery approach. And the advantages uh, are the reduced surgical trauma in postoperative pain, uh, decreased uh, blood loss and transfusion requirements, decreased wound infections, reduced recovery time and shorter hospital stays, better cosmetic result and patient satisfaction. And MICS has already been, uh, also been criticized for its being technically more complex, requires a distinct learning curve, and for more neurological events and aortic dissection in the era when uh, endoaortic uh, balloon was used for uh, cross clamping and for growing complications, but these can be overcome with the passage of time and uh, with the learning curve once you have done that, then the uh, cardiovascular bypass time and cross clamp time comes down. So, uh, as already been discussed, uh, the minimally invasive approach can be uh, under direct vision uh, through a lower stenotomy or uh, through a hemi stenotomy uh, or a right mini thoracotomy, a left mini thoracotomy, or with videoscopic assistance uh, through a port mini thoracotomy with or without robot assistance. And uh, this uh, study uh, in our institution uh, reviews a single institution uh, study of five years experience from January 2018 to, to December 2022. A retrospective observational uh, study was done at AFIC. Uh, total 156 patients with various cardiac surgical diseases underwent MICS. Uh, prior approval from uh, ethical review board was taken and patients data uh, was taken from AFIC cardiac surgery registry. Major variables chosen for the purpose of this study included cross clamp time, cardiovascular bypass time, conversion to median stenotomy, length of hospital stay, and complication rate and mortality rate. And continuous variables were reported as mean plus minus standard deviation, and categorical variables was reported as percentages. And uh, for all analysis, p-value of 0.05 was taken as for statistical significance. The baseline data, uh, the mean age was 38 uh, uh, years, and there was a male preponderance, and the mean base uh, body mass index was 27.4. Uh, 23 of our patients were hypertensive, 13 were diabetic, 18 were smokers, and the mean LV ejection fraction was 54%, and the 47 of our patients had a AF. Distribution cases, uh, 61 of our patients underwent mitral valve replacement uh, or repair, uh, 56 underwent uh, aortic valve replacement, 22 ASD closures, uh, 2 had mitral valve replacement with ASD closures, uh, 2 had mitral valve replacement with tricuspid valve repair, and we recently started our mid-cap program and we have done so far th 13 of mid-cap cases. And distribution of incision types, uh, as the 
Right methylcort pain scene was the most commonest because it gave access to the right and the left atrium. And the partial stenotomy was used for uh, aortic valve cases and uh, left methylcortomy was used for the mid-cap. The arterial cannulation was central aortic in 38 patients and femoral in 105. And the venous cannulation was uh, percutaneous superior venous cable cannulation and direct IVC cannulation in 112 patients and direct uh, right atrial cannulation in 31 patients. We had four patients in which we had to convert to full stenotomy. Uh, the aortic cross clamp mean, aortic cross clamp time was 94 minutes um, and uh, cardiomyopathy bypass time 155 minutes. It was the uh, initial days when we were learning and uh, now with the passage of time it is coming down. The ventilation hours was 7.7 .7 hours, ICU stay was 48 hours and the length of hospital stay was 6 plus minus 1 day. We had 7.69% uh, complication rate which included <coughs> respiratory failure requiring prolonged ventilation, uh, bleeding requiring reopening in uh, four of our patients, four of our patients required CRRT uh, for renal failure, uh, one patient had sternal infection, one patient had GI bleed and uh, treated by a gastroenterologist and one patient had sepsis. The risk factors identified for complications were uh, older age, arterial cannulation site, and prolonged cardiovascular bypass time, and uh, diabetes mellitus. We had uh, a 3.2% mortality, um, and the risk factors associated with the mortality were cardiovascular bypass time, renal failure, wound infection, and septicemia. Just to highlight uh, the technique, we uh, put uh, percutaneous SVC cannula, and uh, along with the centromenous line, this is the draping. The femoral vessels are exposed, and uh, by sending a technique uh, under transit visual guidance, uh, venous cannula, two-stage venous cannula is passed, and then an arterial cannula is passed in the femoral artery, femoral vessels. The right methylcortomy incisions, uh, soft tissue protector, and the pericardium is opened with a long bobby tip. This signet uh, aortic cross clamp is used to cross clamp the aorta. Uh, separate left atrial detector is used to lift the uh, left atrium and expose the mitral valve. And mitral valve that is done by uh, the conventional method. And uh, uh, you can uh, tie the knots with the uh, knot pusher. And the valve is seated. And this is the incisions. Uh, after the right methylcortomy for mitral valve replacement. And we have started our uh, mid-cap program now, and uh, this is the thoracic detector for uh, lima harvesting. The left anterior descending is uh, uh, exposed, and uh, using an octopus uh, on a beating heart lima to LED graft. And this is the incision. Uh, limitations of this study were the retrospective analysis and lack of astronomy control group for appropriate comparison. Uh, in addition, no long-term follow-up follow -up on functional status was available, nor were there any long-term echocardiographic measures. Despite these limitations in this study, we have added to the growing, although still limited, literature on MICS by demonstrating that during a five-year period with more than 150 patients, MICS is an effective and reproducible approach for a variety of cardiac operations. So we conclude by saying that this, in this era of tremendous technological advancement in hybrid procedures, robotic and percutaneous valve interventions, MICS still offers a satisfactory approach to a wide array of cardiac operations. Uh, moreover, MICS in an effective and reproducible approach with nearly comparable mortality and morbidity and it should be used routinely in the surgical management of cardiac diseases. Thank you. Okay, so for the next presentation, I'd like to ask Dr. Farhan to present his topic, Incipient Experience of 600 Plus Cardiac Cases in a Newly Established Cardiac Center. Dr. Farhan.
Ji. Thank you very much. Assalamu alaikum. <coughs> I am Dr. Farhan Rizvi uh, from uh, bah Pervez Line Institute of Cardiology, Bahawalpur. Uh, first of all, uh, it's a matter of great honor and pleasure to represent uh, our institution at such a prestigious uh, platform. For such an act of uh, kindness and encouragement, I am highly obliged and immensely indebted to the organizer of this uh, conference they, that they enabled us to represent a humble data of cardiac cases done uh, at our institution. So first of all, start with the introduction of our uh, <coughs> cardiac center. This is our cardiac center where we do uh, practice. Uh, it was, uh, the cardiac center was established in uh, back in 2018, uh, in June, and uh, it provides uh, these cardiac services in, uh, in terms of cardiology and uh, cardiac surgery. Uh, we are providing uh, emergency services that both includes the primary PCI and emergency cardiac services and uh, also diagnostics, medical surveillance as well as counseling. Uh, the cardiac surgery department comprises of uh, two, uh, two assistant professors, one, assistant, uh, one associate professor and one single senior registrar. Uh, currently we have uh, one uh, anesthetist and a uh, single perfusionist working with us. Now this is the uh, surgical data. Uh, right uh, from the start in June, June 2018, uh, up to November 2023, we have done 661 cases. Definitely, uh, we have not done any um, minimal invasive cardiac surgery cases. They are all open heart surgical procedures. Uh, most of the cases were uh, open heart surgical procedures. That is 97%. Uh, now, segregation of uh, these open heart surgeries include uh, the DVR were 4.2, mitral valve were 15%, aortic valve were 5.4%, and ESDs were. 2.2 a and uh, cabbages were the bulk of uh, open heart surgical procedures that were 70 percent of the cases uh, while uh, closed heart includes uh, cases of pda and we also did a case of uh, covid uh, uh, also did a case of acmo for covid 19 patient the, the mortality data uh, the overall mortality was 5.5 uh, percent uh, was highest mortality was observed in the ECMO patient. Uh, he died uh, on the th third post-operative day. Uh, uh, and the, followed by the DVR patient, that was 7.1%. AVR, 5.5%. Cabbage was 4.9%. And uh, mitral valve patient was 2.9%, while no mortality was observed in congenital cases. And the rest of the other cases. Morbidity data. In this morbidity data, we have included two major morbidities, the cabbages, the uh, major stroke that included the hemiparesis or hemiplegia. 1.5% uh, of uh, patients had major stroke. And among those patients, 30% uh, of the patient died, but 70% survived and they were uh, discharged from the hospital. And while uh, the prolonged ventilation cases, we included the patients uh, that uh, were ventilated more than 48 hours as, uh, as the candidates for prolonged ventilation and uh, unfortunately none of the patients survived. Now the segregation and scrutiny of the mortality. First of all the cabbage patients, uh, the, uh, all the, among all the expired patients the mean age was 65 years. Patients uh, with uh, severe LV dysfunction having ejection infection less than 35 percent were uh, about half of all these expired patients. While 56 of the percent of the patients were diabetics and 21% uh, of the patients, cabbage patients that uh, died were operated on an urgent basis. The mitral valve patients, the, uh, uh, there were two, uh, two patients, uh, one, uh, both the patients have severe pulmonary hypertension was and, uh, and the single patient uh, uh, that had severe RV failure with TAPSI less than one and uh, ejection fraction 30% despite having mitral skin versus glean. While the cases of DVR and other had no risk factors. <coughs> now, uh, if we look, uh, look about the Euroscore prediction of the mortality cases, so among all the expired patients, 12% of the patients were very high risk. They had Euroscore of uh, more than 10 and uh, they had predicted mortality of more than 10%. 
while the 12 percent of the patients had uh, moderate risk patient they had productive mortality more than 4 percent and uh, they had euro score of up to 8 while uh, the uh, rest of the patients were low risk patient and they had euro score of less than 4 having predictive mortality of less than 3 percent now what are the hurdles and hiccups uh, right from the inception of our uh, unit we are uh, facing we are still facing many problems uh, desperately the first of all we are having uh, a lack of administrative support because we are part of a uh, hosp larger hospital and uh, the second important thing that we are having every like every cardiac unit we are having extremely shortage of human resources for example we had uh, uh, one nurse on two bed uh, per shift ratio uh, we have uh, no in cardiac intensivist ice intensivist is present there is only one anesthetist and only one perfinist uh, working with us <coughs> Uh, now, what are the suggestions and submissions uh, for the uh, next uh, every uh, cardiac center if somebody uh, or if some teams want to build a new cardiac center? So, what, are, what should be the sub, uh, suggestions? First of all, if we have, want to have uh, good surgical outcomes, so the uh, surgical team has to be extremely vigilant and on toes right from the start of uh, admission up to the discharge. We have to select the lower risk cases because if we don't have any uh, uh, supporting staff uh, in, in the ICU or in the surgical ward, you have to select the always the lower risk cases so that you, you produce the uh, good results and you build your confidence. The third one is the good anesthesia obviously and intensive care. Because you do the surgery, you do only 20% of the work. The rest of the work is done by the ICU staff and the ICU nurses. You do a very, uh, you do a best surgery, you do a very good valve replacement, but if the surgical nurse or if the ICU nurse do not, uh, does not take, take care of the patient, the patient will die despite having absolutely good surgery. The fourth one is the independent hiring firing authority and uh, the purchase authority for the cardiac center. Uh, we, ha uh, we, have, we have seen that only a cardiac surgeon can, en and can understand the needs and importance of cardiac surgery. No one other than a cardiac surgeon can understand. So if you are a dependent part of a hospital, they will always underestimate your importance and they will always under underestimate the cardiac surgical requirements. So if you have an independent hiring firing authority, that will uh, smooth out your work and uh, th that ease out the procurement as well as purchase of different equipments required for good surgical results. The final one is the relevant and administrative officer. Similarly, if you have an uh, independent hiring firing authority and is not a cardiac surgeon or a cardiologist, so, uh, so he will also do not understand uh, the importance of cardiac surgical. So you, the, a relevant field administrative officer means you have to have a cardiologist or a cardiac surgeon as a administrative officer of your uh, cardiac center uh, that will not only ease out a lot of problems but also encourages the good results and uh, maintains the good functioning of your cardiac unit. Thank you very much. Any questions? My name is Dr. Gibran. I'm a consultant cardiac surgeon in Peshawar General Hospital. I'll be the moderator for the next session. So first of all, I want to give a break to our panelists. Thank you, sir. And I want uh, other panelists to come for the next session. We'll continue the section, uh, session because we are short of time. So respected Dr. Colonel Ahmed, please. Colonel Ahmed. Uh, respected Dr. Brigadier Nasser, please, if you can join us for the panelists. Sorry, please get your own panelists. This is not the way to conduct a conference and this is not the way to honor a guest which you have called. Uh, so sorry for that. Okay, sir. Thank you. <coughs> I'll ask Dr. Abdul Malik, sir, if you can please come to the stage for the panelist. I'll ask uh, Dr. Uh, Yasser Khakwani, please. Uh, 
Sir, if you can join us for the panelist. And Dr. Shahzeb, <coughs> sir, please, if you can join us for the panelist. So we'll continue our session. Uh, so the next talk is about comparison of the outcome of AVR via upper median sternotomy, West conventional sternotomy. Dr. Asim will be presenting. Asim, please come. Thank you. Uh, respected audience uh, and worthy panelists, uh, Assalamu alaikum. Uh, much of my talk has been made easier by Professor Farvez Choudhury, Dr. Yasser Khakwani, Brigadier Amir Saab, and much has been talked about mix and uh, these things. I'll be very specific regarding the upper mirni sternotomy AVR versus conventional sternotomy AVR, uh, and that is how our ex experience is about this particular thing. Uh, I'll, I'll start with a case scenario. This was a very uh, young, 17 years old boy, and uh, a couple of years ago, he presented to us with the three years history of these uh, heart failure symptoms. Uh, he was labeled case of severe AR and uh, was in failure. Uh, multiple consultations were done and multiple uh, echocardiographies were done. Uh, probably that was the reason that he was uh, working with the, one of the generators and was uh, bread earner for the family. That uh, I thought he shall also be given, though we had been into this minimally invasive for a couple of years. Uh, in his case, the annulus was good and it was bicuspid aortic well with severe AR. So we planned him for mini AVR. That's where we operated him. And this is how we do it, upper minister, not me. We do all the conventional uh, CPB circuit to keep the costs at the minimum. And uh, we are operating with conventional surgical instruments at the moment, though we are in the process of uh, procuring the good stuff. Mechanical well 25 size was used in his case, and he had un uh, un uneventful recovery discharge on fourth post-operative day. That is our policy. If somebody is to sick fifth, otherwise fourth post-operative day is the mini VR discharge day. This is how we do it. All the cannulas you do, you see, are in the right atrial cannula, aortic cannula, and a root cannula. I don't put the superior pulmonary vein vent, the whole venting thing, and everything is done by the root cannula. And that is to show you better view. That's it. And this is how it is done. Yes. If there is a concomitant, some mitral thing or some other, we can, or obese patient, we can go to fourth, but usually we go in the third. Uh, initially, I used to slide the blood like J coming from the um, uh, sternal angle on the saw. But uh, with time, I noticed that that actually stresses out the uh, blood, saw blood, as well as it at times gives a bit of injury to the soft tissues, though we don't have serious uh, injuries with the rima so far. But uh, then I changed it uh, that you actually define your, uh, this uh, intercostal space and s slightly like the L type J. Uh, a cut from this side at the third space and then you come from uh, above. That is quite easy with the wireless uh, b brown SARS and wireless battery driven SARS, sternal SARS. Uh, this is that guy. And these are our uh, instruments and displays. Just the same thing that we do conventional, just these axis is different, like Professor Chudri Saab was saying, it's going through the window the, rather than the door. Uh, we have had many AVR cases, and uh, if I'm not wrong, it's, it has crossed 70 figure. But those 
uh, we took the files and the record, which is a pro prospective process that we are gathering the data. But in the same time, we uh, uh, checked the operated convention astronomy. Those were 30 and 35 for uh, the mini VR cases. So we thought this will make good comparison, and we can have this uh, as a comparative study. Uh, this is the preoperative parameters apart from a bit of uh, this, uh, which is again, I think, uh, uh, bystander hypertension. Otherwise, uh, there is no significant difference. Even in that, the p value is just 0 0.06, not touching significance. Uh, and this is the perioperative parameters. If we look into this, in this we have got uh, ventilator uh, in ours. That is significant for uh, conventional sternotomy. And probably that's the reason that we had a bit of more bleeding in these patients. So we went, we waited a lot. Otherwise, otherwise we we do fast track our patients. Uh, the mean uh, nine or in the other group it's around five hours. This is the big difference: the blood transfusions. And I I didn't notice this thing. I we had this uh, very very clear observation, but I didn't think that it will be so much statistically significant that our conventional AVR patients did require more blood products and they were bleeding more, even if they didn't require blood products. And that has got very high statistical significance. None of our mini AVR patients required more than one transfusion, though we reopened one case. But even that was timely, probably because we were not expecting that blood to come from anywhere else, and we reopened timely. So, uh, in the reopening, again, we had two, and uh, that is coming in the other slide. And in the other group, we had one. We had one in, in hospital mortality, unfortunately, in the conventional group. Probably we are selective regarding our AVR and uh, our patients, so we do not have much of the mortality in both the groups. But in the other group, we, in many VR, we didn't have any. Uh, I looked at the relevant literature and uh, this thing, uh, especially in the last uh, five, six years, so I found this study, Polish study, uh, which is uh, 2018, and that they had similar uh, results, uh, less ICU stay, uh, less ventilatory uh, things, and yes, less bleeding and all those things, minimal pain, early recovery, and early discharge. The other study, which is actually having more than 300 cases in each arm, and that was uh, uh, in multiple centers uh, uh, published in 2022, that is also uh, indicating similar, better results. Though, uh, in, the, in one of those studies, the statistical significance of the blood products was not established. But I think with us, that is quite significant. Uh, this was when we did our initial 10 cases. We, uh, in 2019, we presented those 13 cases, I think, in uh, Netherlands in EACVS. And uh, that's how actually they give me the certificate for. And this was our poster over there for the same. And uh, uh, just to uh, talk about one of these patients that we had done mini VR in those days and then that was in 2019. He was in police department and then he got into COVID, was ventilated, prolonged ICU, but recovered. After recovery, he, his heart failure was not improving. It was probably one and a half year down the uh, uh, line when his initial mini VR was done. So when we assessed him, there was actually almost uh, severe AR and it was perivalvular. All the things when we uh, checked him, he, he was treated by cardiologist for compli uh, complications of endocarditis and then referred to us. There was a block as well uh, on TPM. Uh, we, we, we received him and then uh, we found that the reduced surgery was very easy. And uh, we again implanted a bigger size well because the annulus was eaten up by the uh, germs and we implanted another valve but this time we did the conventional sternotomy 27 valve was put and yes he, he needed PPM he is still coming in follow up but a PPM dependent redo AVR 
But this, uh, like I said in the discussion as well, that actually I think uh, any part of the sternum, if we keep intact, that works. But the culprit is the lower sternum. More of the soft tissue in front of it, especially in females, breast tissue is there. And that is uh, a, a big uh, thing for uh, getting infections and uh, oozing. And another thing, the liver uh, mechanism of the lower uh, costal margins are the lower ribs, which uh, if you bend or something. So any, any minimal invasive that you can go even uh, one, in one of the MVR, actually, we went for fifth intercostal upper hemisternotomy, and we managed because he was polio guy, bilateral, but that was MVR, and that's why I didn't discuss here. And still, we had very good recovery because we allowed him crutches on the non cut side of the sternum. Uh, there are challenges, yes, um, a lot of stuff, but uh, this program was trying, and it's easy. We are doing it on our own, and uh, as most of the centers are doing, getting online mentorship, attending workshops, conferences. We initially come, came to, I, I, I uh, used to come religiously whenever Dr. Atikura Mansa would come to AFIC and would be doing cases 2014, 16, and after that, in 17, we started hands on. With this, I thank you all. Thank you. Thank you, Asim, for such a nice presentation. Any comments, any questions? Assalamu alaikum, I'm Dr. Verda. So I wanted to ask uh, why there is a significant uh, difference in your blood product uh, transfusion because other than the sternotomy cutting, everything is same. You are putting on the bypass, doing uh, everything same, same aortotomy, same everything. So where do you think this difference has come from? Yeah, I, as I said, I believe that the more we cut, the more is the raw area. And especially when we are opening the lower part of the sternum, we are stressing a lot of soft tissues. That's why I said that even uh, if you look at the drainage, the drainage is more in the full sternotomy cases, even if they are not needing blood products. Still, the drainage is in oozing is more. So the more area that you cut, the more is, are the chances that there will be oozer, there will be bleeding, periosteal, soft tissue, pericardial, and stretch forces. So I think when you stick to the upper part of the sternum, you just have to take care of the great vessels, innominate, thymic, and the uh, bilateral MS, and the lower soft tissues, unstable sternum that is not coming to play. Any more questions? Any take uh, on this from our panelists, Dr. Yasser? I would just like to uh, add a uh, comment here. Uh, it's a wonderful approach doing upper uh, hemisternotomy, well-established approach, and we've been doing it uh, uh, also back in the UK. But believe me, if you do uh, to the right anterior thoracotomy, doing AVR is much easier to this right anterior hemithoracotomy if you have got the instruments right ones. So that's it, basically. Okay. All right. So right in the support me through third and costal uh, space, uh, you also have to image your aorta because sometimes the aorta is uh, central. Sometimes the right mini incision doesn't uh, give you that much access to the central aorta. And uh, uh, we have done some few cases from the uh, right uh, third and costal space, but uh, you have to image them uh, with CT NGO beforehand just to make out that the aorta is on the right side of the hemisternum. Uh, then you can approach it very easily from the right third, third intercostal space. Uh, that's uh, basically the European approach. Uh, they do the CT uh, preoperatively and they just uh, draw a line in the middle of the sternum this, and they see if the aorta is, uh, for example, on the right side of the, that, that line. 
so it's uh, quite inaccessible or you shouldn't do it but uh, believe me uh, if you go through the second intercostal space and if you've got some difficulty you do just a small wedge of the sternum there then almost 100% of the cases they're accessible through that route means I've been doing it and uh, we've never had a difficulty in uh, approaching the aorta but that's just the uh, experience nothing else uh, thank you very much. Uh, I, I, indeed, that's a very good comment and uh, uh, the same concern I have, like Brigadier Ramesh have said, and probably um, the more expertise you are having in the ethericotomy side, so probably you are. But uh, I discussed this thing with uh, one of the German surgeons who is doing Robert Malan. He is doing only aortic. And, and, and he said we started with thoracotomy and we ended up in upper mean sternotomy. And still, when I shared my cases at that time, 26, 29, with him, he said, I'll not try with conventional this thing. I'll postpone my case with the, for an endo claim. If I don't have and I will not do even upper means to not me AVR. So that's like they are having technology gadgets. We actually try to avoid that CT scan, that extra thing. And with upper means to not me, we, at, at all level, we are easy with taking any patient. The only contraindication to isolated AVR in our setup is now that if we think there is something else which cannot be addressed by this. Like there is concomitant cabbage, concomitant mitral well disease that needs to be like LA opened, checked, or uh, things like that. So then we go for uh, conventional stenotomy. Otherwise, any AVR, OBs, everyone we are taking as mini now. Thank you. Asim, thank you very much for your nice presentation. But I think uh, <clears throat> adopting the uh, right to record to me, we can, we may have a good exposure for the mitral as well. Uh, we in LRH, we have done a lot of cases through the right to thoracotomy for mitral ASD and even uh, attempted uh, VSD closure through the right to thoracotomy. And I think uh, all the cases, they were done very well with good results and uh, no uh, sternal dehiscence, all these uh, good effects of the uh, thoracotomy. Thank you very much. Uh, one one other uh, point is that, uh, as Professor Pavlis Chaudhary said, that the cartilage doesn't uh, heal <coughs> that well. Uh, I would like to ask Dr. Asir, uh, what do you do with the uh, costal cartilage? It's, uh, do you cut that uh, on the second intercostal? Do you divide it and, and do you re-stitch it with the bond or do you plate, put a plate there? Uh, no, uh, I never used to cut any of the costal uh, cartilages. Most of the time, uh, you are able to do without any cutting of the costal, just uh, split open uh, the intercostal space and you're there. Sometimes when you've got difficulty in approaching, as uh, Dr. Chodhi said, just cut a small wedge of the sternum and everything is in, in front of you. Uh, do some of the hitching stitches on the pericardium and everything is in front of you. And especially, the, uh, the more Can emphasis uh, should be on your propionist. Good drainage is very important. If the drainage is good, heart is decompressed, everything is in front of you. So that becomes quite easy. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, awesome. Awesome. Thank you. We are short of time. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Just one comment. Uh, Abdul Mai Sahib is very right and that is very valid thing. If you go by right to record me, you can have access to all the wells. We do right to record me for ASD, VSD and mitrals, if that is the case. But I am saying if it is isolated AVR, or Chai says upper minister, not me. Thank you. Thank you, Asim. The, uh, the anterior right thoracotomy is a very good exposure for everybody. And I mean, the way I was trained, you, you have to uh, cut the cartilage. So the way it helps, if you don't cut the cartilage, if you spread the ribs, the crack, so you're bound to break the ribs anyway. You know, the space is not that much, but you put a retractor there and you open it, it's going to break anyway. So if you cut the cartilage, it gives you space and later on at the end of the procedure, so you don't have to cut the, uh, the sternum, what you do is you put a stitch there at the end and that really keeps it up and closes the space very nicely. So this is, this is one of the uh, very commonest, uh, the, the traditional technique of uh, writing the thoracotomy. It goes uh, before the aortic valve. I think it's a doable technique, it's not difficult, it's reproducible. If you do it, uh, yes, uh, you said the drainage is very important, the cannulations, the venous cannula, the types of venous cannula, whether two stage, one stage, you have a suction on your bypass machine, because there's a lot of role of profuse 
in minimal access surgery. Otherwise, you just struggle with your surgery. The trail is not well. And the, the vent into the right spirit pulmonary vein, that's very useful because right there, when you open the space and you get there and you see the right spirit pulmonary vein, you're at the right space. That's one of the things. Uh, this is this is approach and I think if you get used to it, it is doable. Thank you, sir. So the next talk is of Dr. Anas Ahmed from Omar Hospital uh, regarding uh, mid-cab off-pump with partial lower median sternotomy. Thanks for inviting me here. My name is Dr. Anas Ahmed and I'm going to share my experience of uh, off-pump uh, off mid-cab with partial lower stenotomy. It is a less invasive approach with a maximum exposure. Idea behind using uh, partial lower stenotomy was how we can preserve the safety and effectiveness of the bypass surgery in a less invasive operation that one can learn and perform routinely. So minimally invasive cardiac surgery includes mid-cab, that is a minimally invasive direct coronary artery bypass and totally endoscopic coronary artery bypass, port access coronary artery bypass and hybrid coronary revascularization is also included. Mid-cab off-pump, u is then off-pump and it was initially used to uh, target the LED lesions. Two approaches are usually used, left anterior small thoracotomy and partial lower stenotomy. So our prefer, a preferred approach in this study is partial lower stenotomy and we do it uh, through Zephy sternum and, uh, they, and take it up through the uh, third intercostal space in an inverted J-shaped fashion. Purpose of this study was to demonstrate the safety and efficacy of this technique. A mid-cap done through left anterior thoracotomy cat uh, usually caters LED lesions only but partial lower sternotomy provides good access to the left and the right-sided lesions. We conducted a study, that, a retrospective study in our Omer Hospital, in which uh, we included 64 patients and divided them into three groups. Mean age was 65 plus minus 5.3, and 28 patients had double vessel coronary artery disease, nine patients had single vessel, and 27 patients had triple vessel coronary artery disease. Lima was used to graft the LED and the great saphenous vein was used to graft the rest of the vessels. This is how we give the incision. The skin incision from the fourth intercostal space to below the cephoid. And then sternotomy from the Zephyr sternum to the third intercostal space below the manubrious sternal joint. Lima is harvesting using Fevolora's retractor. This is uh, the video. Can you play the video? This is how we harvest the Lima using this approach. The sternum is divided partially uh, from the lower end and Lima is harvested with the same amount of ease and speed as in the conventional uh, median standard median stenotomy. This partial lower stenotomy uh, provide, has a better stability because uh, the superior sternum is intact and it uh, gives uh, us more stability and uh, leads to earlier mobilization of the patient and shorter ICU stays. Few, uh, there were some exclusion criteria that were, we included in the study. The morbid obese patients were not included in the study. Severely impaired LV function was not included and chronic kidney disease and significant carotid and neurologic disease. Uh, patients that ha were having these uh, significant carotid and neurologic disease were not included in the study. Results of our study were Length of the incision was 
8.47 plus minus 1.2 centimeters. Average number of grafts were two, that is, uh, varied from one to three. No blood transfusion was required, no sternal dehiscence, and lima, was, uh, lima harvesting and grafting done with the same ease as with the full sternotomy. Left and right sided lesions addressed with the same ease as with the full sternotomy and less post-operative pain and earlier post-operative, uh, earlier mobilization led to shorter hospital stay and improved cosmesis is a plus point as well. And there was no post-operative angina was reported after uh, the patients that underwent off-pump mid-cap through partial lower stenotomy. Conclusion of the study is Partial lower sternotomy is a less invasive and effective approach for off-pump mid-cap, providing surgeon with the same amount of ease and speed of uh, harvesting the lima and grafting the right and left-sided lesions. It offers better sternal stability and uh, improved cosmesis. I have included a few literature. This literature also gives us uh, uh, an evidence that shows the partial median sternotomy uh, provides us a better uh, uh, so it provides us <coughs> better uh, usually we can graft the right and left side lesions with the same amount of ease and speed and uh, better sternal stability and leading to earlier mobilization and lesser post uh, lesser hospital stays any questions please so you, uh, you said that the, the the average number of grafts were two in the majority of the cases. So, yes, uh, were they the right and the LAD? Uh, were you able to uh, reach the? Uh, is it? Uh, do you find it difficult to uh, approach the OMs on this from this? No, sir. We didn't uh, find any difficulty in uh, grafting the OM. And um, we, uh, uh, graft, we have grafted LAD, uh, OMs, and uh, distal RC here with the same ease. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. So <clears throat> we have four uh, presentations left. Uh, if we can have a short tea break and then we can come back. Thank you.
सर हमारे इंस्टीट्यूशन में आज तक देखने ये सी है सर क्या लगे इंस्टीट्यूशन में मेरा आने में सारे बस एक ही उसमें लालच के अलावा लालच जो है ना वो तो सर आप परिवार के यहाँ से देख सकते हो और बस फिर मैं कि जी एच के एजेंसी है के ए सी है एच एम सी के ए सी और दो और भी बन गए
you can fit it in one of the pieces of the The big picture lady will hold it more. Same thing. Uh huh. There is one of the pieces. Okay.
असल में मुझे मैसेज मिला है खाने में ये है तो अभी अभी तो बुरा नहीं है क्या भूषण का सफर में आप लोग के लिए पॉसिबली सर अभी यहाँ पर कौन है तो फिर यहाँ पे अभी डिस्ट्रीब्यूट तो नहीं होंगे हम लोग लेके जा रहे हैं तुम्हें नहीं जो वो इस तरह है ना यहाँ पर मैनेजर कौन है ये शील्ड वगैरह लेने आया सर ना तुमको देने में डिस्ट्रीब्यूट होंगे ना अभी जी सर अभी सर एक मिनट में वोट करें मैं बुला लेता हूँ सर जैसे कुछ लोग को लेके जा रहे हैं मैं पूछ लेता हूँ उसको सर ये हो क्या रहा है सेशन हम अगला कब शुरू करें ये टी ब्रेक ब्रेक के बाद टी ब्रेक टी ब्रेक हो पा रही है टी ब्रेक इधर तो कोई टी नहीं है वो भी वो लगने ही होगा नहीं ये तो इस ये जो चीज़ है ये तो इसके बाद मिलेंगे ना मार्क्सिंग जो मेरे पास आए थे
देख आप नहीं गए
कितनी खोलनी पड़ेगी एंड टाइम पे एक
ठीक है वैसे So, uh, welcome back from the tea, and uh, we are moving towards the last uh, few talks of uh, this uh, uh, whole conference, actually. And then, uh, followed following that, will be uh, our closer uh, closing ceremony for the thing. So, uh, I would like to invite now Brigadier uh, Imran Asir from AFIC to present on next generation cardiac solutions the evolving landscape of beating heart surgery in pakistan Bismillah rahman rahim Next generation cardiac solutions. Uh, wo ek chota sa vaakya sir. 
हमारे वो एक टीचर थे उन्होंने हमें कहा कि आपके इधर डिप्टी कमिश्नर साहब आ रहे हैं तो उनको शुक्रिया का लेटर लिखें मैट्रिक में हम थे हमने लिखा जी आपकी बड़ी मेहरबानी है आप आए हैं बड़ी मेहरबानी तो वो जिस तरह सिंपल सिंपल इंग्लिश में उर्दू में हमने लिखा तो हमारे उर्दू के टीचर थे वो कहते हैं मैट्रिक के बच्चे इस तरह नहीं लिखते मैट्रिक के बच्चे लिखते हैं कि हम आपके बड़े मशहूर हैं कि आपने अपने कदूम मेहमत लजूम से हमें रफ़ील मरतबत फरमाया तो हम आप लोगों के बड़े मशहूर हैं कि आपने कदूम मेहमत लजूम से मुझे रफ़ील मरतबत फरमाया मैं इधर आ गया थैंक यू वेरी मच अच्छा सर इम्तियाज मस्ट बी सिटिंग अराउंड यस इम्तियाज़ की और मेरी अक्सर बहस हुआ करती थी कि बीटिंग हार्ट जो है ना ये नहीं करना चाहिए ये एनेस्टमोसिस को जपडाइज कर देता है और एक सिंपल सा फिजिक्स का असूल है कि जी बीटिंग टारगेट इज़ डिफ़िकल्ट टू हिट एंड देर इज़ नो डाउट अबाउट दैट हम इसी के ऊपर थे कि इतना बीटिंग हार्ट आपको आना चाहिए कि बॉटम मैंड से कोई थोड़ी बहुत ब्लीड हो और आप एक दो टाँके लगा सकें दैट इज़ एनफ इससे ज़्यादा आप पेशेंट के साथ जुलम करते हैं ये रीज़न बड़ी सिंपल थी कि बीटिंग हाज जो मूविंग टारगेट इज़ डिफ़िकल्ट टू हिट सो वॉट हैपन्ड देर आर सर्टन थिंग्स विच हैपन्ड एंड वी वर पुश टू डू दी कार्ड एक सर्जी बीटिंग हार्ट एंड दैट वॉज कोविड पेंडेमिक ड्यू टू कोविड पेंडेमिक देर वर मैनी इशूज इन सप्लाई चेन टू इशूज केम अप रिसेंटली सर वन वॉज कोविड एंड सेकेंड वॉज डिप्रीसीशन ऑफ आर करेंसी विद दिस डिप्रीसीशन देर वॉज लॉट ऑफ इशू विद ऑक्सीजन ऑक्सीजनेटर सप्लाई इन दिस सिचुएशन वी वर पुस्ट टू डू दॉप कैप नॉ दिस वॉज द स्टेट ऑफ अफेयर्स ऑफ डॉलर एंड पाकिस्तान करेंसी इन पाकिस्तान लुक वन जीरो फाइव एंड हेयर वी इंक्रीज ऑन आर ऑप कैप दिस इज द डाटा ऑफ लास्ट फिफ्टीन ईयर्स ऑफ ए एफ आई सी अनिशियली वी वर नॉट वेरी क्यूरियस ऑफ डूइंग ऑप कैप्स but later on with passage of time we came to know that there is no harm acquiring this skill as well and this salvaged us from this disaster of uh, dollar and supply chain 15 surgeons in afic started with it but now only four are doing and uh, brigadier nasser is one of the pioneers he started optionally and we were pushed to start yes <coughs> problem is one moving target moving target this is the problem but you know it it's lot harder but with proper training and practice you can do it practice patient Uh, patience and precision are the keys the issue is ke now there is no more issue of supply chain should we continue doing op cab or should should we withhold cabbage as a gold standard is there or aage abhi hum dekhte hain now there are three three types of targets one is moving target the other target is tied with, tied with chain and the third target is still target this new innovation restricted the target movement abhi dekhiyega jo apex of the heart hai uska और जो स्टेबलाइजर के अंदर टिश्यू है उसमें कितना फर्क है 
ये बिल्कुल उसी तरह है जैसे एक टारगेट मूविंग टारगेट है और अब हमने इसकी मूवमेंट रिस्ट्रिक्ट कर दी है चेनिंग ऑन द साइड अब सवाल ये है कि हमें पता है कि कार्डियो पलमनरी बाईपास की बहुत कॉम्प्लिकेशन है एंड वी टॉक अ लॉट अबाउट दैम एंड हेयर इज द स्लाइड दैट देयर आर सो मैनी कॉम्प्लिकेशन शुड वी रियली नॉट कंपेयर द बेनिफिट्स ऑफ ऑप कैप विद दिस अगर ये जो स्लाइड है दिस इज रिलेटेड टू सम प्रोजेक्ट्स ये प्रोजेक्ट्स के लिए होती है कि इट्स वेरी रेयर कम्बिनेशन के कोई प्रोजेक्ट क्वालिटी में भी अच्छा हो उसकी प्राइस भी कम हो और वो टाइम भी बचाए बिफोर 1960 All these things were being done. कभी abrasions के साथ adhesions create की गई कभी muscles को use किया गया momentum को use किया गया हर चीज use की गई before bypass. Op cab की history cabbage की history से पुरानी है 1961 सिक्सटी वन में जर्मनी में नाइनटीन सिक्सटी फोर में रशिया में और फिर 1975 में कनाडा और अमेरिका में ये चीज़ प्रूव हो गई कि ऑप कैब सेफली किया जा सकता है लेकिन जब 1960 आया और बाईपास मशीन स्टार्ट हुई उसके बाद लोगों ने इसको छोड़ दिया बिकॉज द स्टिल टारगेट वाज बेटर एंड इट वाज नॉट डिफिकल्ट टू हिट बट सम पीपल कैप डूइंग इट और दिस वॉज द फर्स्ट मैन हु डेड ऑप कैब इन नाइनटीन सिक्सटी एंड हेयर इज दीरीज कोई पॉइंटर है ये पॉइंटर नहीं चल हो बंद हो अभी सर हम ना जो 60 साल के बाद चीज़ करना चाह रहे हैं ना किधर है इसके वो नहीं है लेजर भी अच्छा छोड़ें थॉर और कॉटमी विद बीटिंग हार्ट एंड दिस पर्सन डेड इट 60 इयर्स अगो एंड वी आर स्टिल रिलेक्टेंट टू डू इट and this is series this is a series of patient ab this is the difference i still consider that the it's not a moving target it's a restricted target these two people made real inventions by inventing stabilizers for op cap and uh, the results are in front of us with low mo uh, mortality morbidity and reduced costs <coughs> i'll share with you some analysis jo best analysis hote hain wo hote hain ya meta analysis ya randomized control trials trials and here we are 2002 mein ek randomized control trial hua aur iski cheeze main aapko pad deta hu ke the chest inf infections are reduced inotropic requirement is reduced supraventricular arrhythmias blood transfusions icu stay and uh, no difference in terms of survival at 2 years 14% cost ki sa savings thi grafts were equal better symptomatic outcome with op cap and less complications इट्स इवन बेटर विद हाई रिस्क ग्रुप्स अब कुछ आती हैं हाई रिस्क कंसेंस स्टेटमेंट्स कंसेंस कंसेंस स्टेटमेंट्स आर कंप्रीहेंसिव पब्लिक स्टेटमेंट्स बाय टीम ऑफ एक्सपर्ट्स इन द फील्ड 
These are developed after faculty-led consensus day, where experts meet and review opinion, evidence-based research, and analyze it to come up to uh, come up with a collective view on the issue in hand. Now, in 2004, with level A and B evidence, it was proven that OPCAB is a safe alternative, similar completeness of revascularization, reduced perioperative morbidity, minimized midterm cognitive dysfunction, quality of life is better, and it reduced duration of ventilation, ICU stay, and resource utilization. Same thing was repeated in 2015, same 2017, and we keep on going 2019, 20, 22, with 11,000 patients reg registry. And up till now, in last was in last month, sir. The last month, the registry was of about 40,000 patients, and they concluded the reduction of 49% in risk of myocardial infarction and 16% reduced risk of stroke in OPCAP patients. This is recent, the most recent, about a month ago. Here are our uh, data. <coughs> in AFIC, we did more than 9,000 cases. About 2,200 cases were of OPCAP. The results are like this. There were more, more females, relatively more age in OPCAP patients, and there was, they were more obese. Look at the results. The same results, the same replication, without a full stop over and under. It's absolutely the same results which was seen to, in 2004. We presented 13 international studies and our data of 9,000 cases. The final thoughts are OPCAP outperforms ONCAP in multiple variables, withholds quality standards without compromise, and we advocate for compre comprehensive training and practice of OPCAD for future generations. Second thing come up, the cost. We have concluded that that we save 170,000 rupees if we do OPCAP. We save time as well. So again, the same tribe. That we have got a very good offer here. It's safe, it's fast, it's cheap. Now the development of OPCAP, uh, MidCAP came and they claim that they have extubated the patient in OR and early discharge. There are studies on it. We started in, this is the drawing of one of my colleague, the man with, uh, you know, glasses. He was from Italy. He made this drawing for me. And he told me that we need not to make big incisions. And here is another person. Sir, ye wo am Dr. Harris ke father. So he told me that nahi sternum ko upar se niche khola karo. So we started sternum ko upar se niche khola shuru kar diya. So jab iske saath maine isko combine kiya na, to 2010 mein, sorry, 2011 mein maine pehla AVR kiya. Mini se. 2014 mein humne MVR kiya. और अभी हमने ये इसके साथ मिनी कैबेज किया। ज़्यादा एडवांसेज आ गई हैं। Conclusions: The evolving landscape of beating heart surgery highlights the safety and equal efficacy of OPCAP. This technique needs to be integrated into cardiac surgical training. We need to leave our comfort zone to achieve it. And if you break the laws of physics, 
If you break the law of humans, you go to jail. If you break the law of God, you go to hell. But if you break the laws of physics, you go to Sweden and collect your Nobel Prize. So I am going for that. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Imran Azhar sir. Any questions, comments, please? Uh, next person. Okay, we are short of the time, so we'll uh, start the next talk. So next next talk is Dr. Mansoor Tariq from PIC Peshawar. Factors, predictors, and incidence of conversion of off-pump cabbage to on-pump cabbage. Mansoor. Good morning, everyone. In this dynamic realm of cardiac surgery, I, Dr. Muhammad Mansoor Tariq, am here to present the groundbreaking insights into the intra-op conversion of off-pump cabbage to on-pump coronary artery bypass grafting. So this article delves into the intricacies of this presentation, exploring the incidence, causes, and factors causing the intra-op conversion from off-pump to on-pump shedding light onto the topic that is crucial for the advancement of cardiac surgical practices. Before delving into this topic, into its specifics, it is essential to understand the fundamental concepts and the differences between the off-pump cabbage and on-pump cabbage. So I'll be going briefly through these. So on-pump cabbage has its own pros, stable environment, complete arterial revasc. You have a wider surgical access, myocardial protection, on-pump cabbage has its cons, like systemic inflammatory response, increased bleeding and transfusion requirements, high risk of neurological injury, and AKI. Whereas the off-pump cabbage offers reduced systemic inflammatory response, lower risk of neurological complications, AKI. Whereas its cons are incomplete revasc, limited surgical access, and risk of hemodynamic instability. So the rationale of this study is important is due to its conversion from off-pump to on-pump and, the, and their associated risk factors. Especially, it's important to identify these factor, uh, risk factors for the improvement of cardiac surgical practices. So our study design was a re retrospective case control study conducted at Peshawar Institute of Cardiology from 1st June 2022 to 30th June 2023. The number was 714. So data analysis used SPSS version 22, presenting frequencies, percentages, mean, and standard deviation. Binary logistic regression examined determinants of off-cabs to off-cabs to on-pump, with the factors having p-value of less than 0.25. So the significance was set at p-value of less than 0.05. So I'll be going briefly through the results. So the total cabbage pro off cabbage procedure performed was 714. Out of that, the conversion rate was 3.78%. The average, going through the demographics, the average age of the patients were 59. Our study was mainly dominated by the male population. Majority of them were obese, hypertensive, and diabetic. 40% of the patients were smokers as well. So. Regarding NGO, 70% of the patients have TV cat. Amongst them, 11% of the patients have LMS disease, while the rest of them were DV cat. So the primary reasons for conversion were, as I mentioned earlier, the conversion rate was 3.78%. So the emergent conversion was 22%, and the planned conversion from op cabbage to on pump was 77.78. So the factors leading to those conversions were Majority of them were due to the hemodynamic instability, around 66.67%, attributed to low pressures and arrhythmias of 83.33% and 16% respectively, followed by uh, poor targets of 14.81 and arteriectomy requiring long, uh, long patch plasty of 11% and inadequate visualization of 7.41%. So here's the table. So as I mentioned earlier, all the pros and cons of off-pump and on-pump cabbages. So in our study, a one-year study, identified a conversion rate of 3.78%. Uh, 
So similar conversion rates were found in the studies by Chakravati et al. and Deepak et al. Their conversion rate was 6.49%. So the left main stem stenosis, 50 to 70% emerged as a sole significant factor for the conversion. The p-value was less than 0 0.001. So primary reason, for, uh, primary reason for conversion was the hemodynamic instability. That was the leading cause for conversion attributed to low pressures and arrhythmias. So the other reasons for conversion were end arteriectomy requirement, 11.11% and poor visualization. So going through the demographics, age, gender, and comorbid conditions like diabetes, hypertension did not significantly affect the conversion rates. However, our study has its own limitations, like it's a retrospective study and the need for the larger studies to explore the determinants further. So at the end, the conclusion was that our study report shows a conversion rate of 3.78% patients undergoing off-pump coronary artery bypass grafting, hemodynamic instability as the main reason for conversion, and the left main stem stenosis of 50 to 70% as the only predictor of conversion. Here are the references. Thank you. Any questions, please? Assalamualaikum. I have uh, an experience of, uh, I would say, 14-15 um, years of doing uh, uh, pump, uh, uh, off pump surgery. So uh, I would say uh, to start with, when you open up the chest, always look at the heart. Yes. The heart is stable. Uh, I mean, there is, uh, it's not struggling. Uh, only then you do the op. Uh, 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 off-cap surgery. Mm -hmm. Don't attempt it on a struggling heart, mm -hmm. number one. Number two, uh, it is also mentioned in the book and in our experience, left main stem disease, if the heart is stable, yes. it is just a relative indication. You can do it on uh, uh, left main stem as well. Regarding the positioning of the heart, mm -hmm. ischemia is not important. What happens when you, uh, when you are doing uh, grafting on the lateral wall or you are lifting up the heart and you, you are attempting PDA, otherwise you see uh, LED is the most important graft. Mm. It, it supplies nearly 50 to 60 percent of the heart. So what happens when you, when you are dealing with the lateral wall or, or with the PDA? When you lift the heart, there is the mechanics of the heart, I mean it goes wrong. Important thing is, uh, in that situation, patient may develop, develop acute MR. So you can visibly see that the heart is now distending. Do not attempt uh, uh, grafting on, on a dis distending heart. That is the time when you should decide that now is the time either I give some rest to the heart or I should convert it to the, uh, uh, to the conventional uh, on form surgery. So that is the catch. Uh, Otherwise, I think with experience, you can do wonders. Mm -hmm. uh, exactly. But acute MR, always look at the heart. If it is distending, that means mechanics of the heart are disturbed. It is not, not the ischemia, it is the mechanics. I appreciate it, sir. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mansoor Tariq, for such a nice presentation. So we'll move on. Uh, we are already late. So the next presenter is Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed from AFIC. Dr. Imtiaz is in the hall. Oh, oh yes, sorry. Come, sir. Today I'll be talking about early post-operative outcomes of single versus multiple arterial grafts in cabbage surgery. Okay, so this is an image, uh, angiographic image of a patient uh, with radial artery grafts and this was done 15 years uh, earlier and you see the radial artery has a smooth contour and it is disease free. So Alain Carpentier uh, pioneered the use of radial artery grafts in cabbage surgery and in his landmark article which was published in 1973, he reported the use of 40 radial artery grafts with excellent short-term results. 
So he mentioned that the radial artery uh, has a good length and it can be used uh, to construct two arterial grafts. In his work, dilatation of the radial artery was achieved with the help of mechanical dilators for ranging in size from one to three millimeters. And this was done in order to overcome the spasm of the radial artery. However, however just two years after the publication, he advised against the use of radial artery due to high incidence of occlusion. The narrowing of the arterial graft was related to the spasm of the denervated artery. The radial artery should not be used as a coronary, uh, in coronary surgery until this physiological problem has been resolved. This was his remarks two years after his initial article. So this is an image here which shows the histological specimens of a radial artery, left internal mammary artery and the syphilis vein. And you'd see the radial artery has a very thick muscular layer which is prone to spasm. In 1992, that was about 18 years after uh, Carpentier's publication, Akar and associates demonstrated that the initially occluded radial artery grafts were actually patent 18 years after follow-up. And they also reported their own series of patients who had undergone uh, radial artery harvest. And this time they used a refined technique. They harvested the artery along with its uh, associated veins and uh, soft tissue. And uh, for dilatation, they used papaveri. So the REPCO trial was a randomized control trial, and this was done in order to see the angiographic patency of radial artery grafts. So it had two parallel limbs. One compared the radial artery to the right thoracic artery, and the second limb compared the radial artery to the syphilis vein. The investigators found that at 10 years, the radial artery had a better uh, patency as compared to the right internal thoracic artery, and it also had a better uh, patency as compared to the uh, syphilis vein. So these are several randomized control trials which have demonstrated beyond doubt that the radial artery is better than the syphilis vein. The guidelines started recommending the use of radial artery uh, from 2018 and uh, the 2021 radial, uh, the guidelines recommend uh, the use of radial artery in preference to the septus vein to, con to uh, bypass the second most important significantly stenosed non-LED vessel to imp improve long-term cardiac outcomes. So most of the radial artery occlusions occur during the first six months and evidence shows that after one year, the radial artery graft uh, remains stable virtually without no attrition up to 20 years. This is a radial artery with a string sign and this is seen about in 7% of patients. So the, the determinants of radial artery patency depend on the symptoms, on the target coronary artery, and on competitive flow. Patients with sequential radial artery grafts have a better uh, patency. Now I'd like to share our experience. So this graft, uh, the graph here shows uh, our total workload of cabbage surgeries. The vertical bars are the cabbage surgeries and the solid black line indicates Lima usage. So we're using Lima in about 91 to 92% of our patients. This graph, graph here shows our uh, second arterial graft usage. Uh, the solid bars are uh, the right internal and thoracic artery usage, which is not very high. And the solid red line indicates the radial artery usage, which has uh, gone an exponential increase in the past two years. So the number of uh, cabbage surgeries versus radial artery grafts performed. So this year we performed radial artery grafts in about 16% of our patients. So this is our setup of uh, multi-arterial grafting. Here uh, the radial artery is being harvested, left internal mammary artery is being harvested as long 
as well as the Stephanus vein, and this is being done simultaneously. Just a small clip to show how we do our radial artery. So we do it with an open technique, subcutaneous tissue dissection. The radial artery is exposed. So the radial artery pedicle is then uh, made and a vascular loop is passed around it. It contains the soft tissue as, as well as the vena committentes and all the muscular branches are clipped. The proximal and distal ends of the radial artery are tied. Then the radial artery is transected at both ends. And then it is flushed with hepatitis saline. And uh, gentle hydrostatic dilatation is also done. Then this artery is stored in a solution which contains blood, heparin, and papaverine. For distal anastomosis, we use proline 8 or 7 -0. For top ends, we uh, prefer aorto uh, radial uh, anastomosis. We use a 3.5 millimeter punch and we use proline 7 uh, for the anastomosis. So in our uh, study, we compared multi-arterial grafting, patients who had undergone cabbage with lima and a radial artery graft with or without vein grafts with uh, the patients who had undergone uh, conventional cabbage surgery. There was no difference as far as the basic demographics were concerned. However, we did a multi-arterial grafting in the slightly younger age group. There was no difference as far as smoking, diabetic status, ejection fraction, left main stem disease or extent of coronary artery disease was concerned. When we compared both groups uh, with equal number of grafts, we found no difference as far as bypass time or cross clamp time was concerned. The inotropic uh, duration, ventilation time, and ICU stay was less in our multi-arterial group. However, this was not statistically significant. So uh, the chest drainage was significantly less in our multi-arterial group. Uh, the hospital stay duration was shorter in our multi-arterial group. There was no difference as far as Transfusion requirements were concerned, CKMB levels were concerned, dysrhythmias or outcomes. So this is one of our post-operative images done at one year, and this shows a pat patent grafts and a patent radial artery which has been uh, anastomosed to the uh, OM2. This patient was from Peshawar and he came to us and he wanted to have his surgery in which the radial artery was uh, used. So just uh, complications that we encountered. One of our patients had vascular insufficiency and we had to do uh, interposition vein graft. This is the scar uh, at, on the first post-operative visit. So the radial artery is easy to harvest. It is a time-tested, robust graft. Several randomized controlled trials and meta-analyses have reported superior long-term patency over cephalous vein grafts. And it should be used more frequently in cabbage surgery. Thank you. Uh, actually, I was the interpreter for uh, uh, Imtiaz. When this patient came to Imtiaz, he said, last number of Gakhle. So he asked, what is this? 
मैंने कहा वो कहते हैं मेरे हाथ से अब मतलब पीपल आर सो अवेयर एंड ही वॉज नॉट अ वेरी एजुकेटेड पर्सन और उसको ये पता था कि जी ऐसा भी होता है कि हाथ से आर्टरी ली जा ली जाती है सो दिस इज ना एवरी मतलब कॉमन पीपल आर नोइंग के इसका ज़्यादा बेनिफिट है तो डेफिनेटली हमारे हमें अपनी प्रैक्टिस चेंज करने की ज़रूरत है और हमें ज़्यादा अब इस आर्टिकल ग्राफ्टिंग की तरफ जाने की ज़रूरत है थैंक यू एनी अदर क्वेश्चन Thank you very much, sir. Very nice presentation, and of course, uh, total arterial is the thing. Uh, radial artery, uh, it's it's having very good length, and uh, we usually prefer to graft the PDR right side distal with <coughs> this radial, and the bilateral IM is uh, sequencing as Y and compositing on there, so that gives easily four grafts for total arterial revascularization. Um, uh, however, any any such experience that you I have come across because so far I have not come across this thing that the radial artery is not of good quality or it cannot be used. Uh, have you experienced any such issue, sir? No. So, uh, normally, uh, a size of radial artery which is less than 1.5 millimeter is considered a very small size. So, uh, I have seen that in one or two female patients. Uh, but we use that uh, the best. Uh, in one patient, we found uh, when we exposed the radial artery, we found calcification all along its course, and we did not harvest that radial artery. So these were the two problems that we encountered. Uh, however, in patients who have undergone radial artery um, injury through through the radial artery, that radial artery uh, uh, cannot be used because of intimal trauma. So these are the broad uh, contraindications that we. And sir, which case you have chosen? Asim, we are short of time. Uh, uh, we are we are using Norvask 2.5 milligram BD, and we uh, give that for six months. Thank you, Dr. Imtiaz Ahmed, for such a wonderful presentation about radial artery. So I know you all are tired, but uh, this is the last presentation. And uh, this is the, the title of the presentation is Does Timing of the Cabbage affect early outcome in NSTEMI. So the presenter will be Dr. Hasibo Rahman from AKU. Please, Hasib. Okay. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon. Assalamu alaikum. Uh, so the, the, uh, the question is, does timing of cabbage affect early outcomes in NSTEMI? So this is an aerial view of my hospital, Aachen University Hospital. I have nothing to disclose. So this will be the outline of my presentation for the next seven minutes. So it is estimated that there were 20.5 million deaths globally in the year 2021, and these were due to cardiovascular diseases. Out of these, more than 50% were due to, uh, were in Asia and Australasia. That was around 12 million deaths. So in patients who have had an NSTEMI and now require a surgical revascularization, the question is, when should we operate? So the timing of surgery is controversial, whether we should go for an early cabbage or a delayed cabbage. So the ideal time to operate, whether it is in the same hospital admission that is within 48 hours, after 48 hours, or in a separate hospital admission that is after a week or within six weeks. So early cabbage has its own pros and cons. Um, it uh, provides prompt revascularization, preserves viable myocardium, and avoids readmission for the patient. Uh, but on the other hand, the myocardium is edematous. Uh, there are more chances of bleeding, bleeding because patients have received ACS protocol. Uh, they have had an uh, angiography for which they are at increased risk of acute kidney injury. So there is a good saying that a good surgeon is one who knows how to operate. A better surgeon is one who knows when to operate. And the best surgeon is one who knows when not to operate. So the literature on timing of cabbage uh, after an NSTEMI is divided and there, are, there is very little literature available. So studies done by Lee et al. Uh, and Anton et al. Uh, show that timing uh, does have a 
impact on the outcome and it's better to wait uh, after an NSTEMI before going for cabbage. Uh, but uh, some uh, studies like from Brexton et al. show that uh, timing does not have any significant effect on the outcomes. So the literature is divided. So uh, objective of our study was to identify the optimal timing of cabbage after NSTEMI. And the reason for doing this study was that it's a controversial topic in literature. And there are no studies done in Pakistan as per our knowledge. Uh, and uh, if we are able to find the optimal timing, we'll be able uh, to reduce the mortality and morbidity. So this was a retrospective cohort study done at the Aachen University Hospital. Uh, we enrolled patients who were operated between January 2018 to December 2021. Uh, ERC approval was taken. Uh, we had 175 patients who were divided into three groups. Uh, group A consisted of 103 patients who were operated within 48 hours of NSTEMI. Uh, group B had 41 patients who were operated between 2 to 6 days. And group C had 31 patients who were operated between 6 days to 6 weeks. Data was collected from patients' files and our database. And we did the analysis on uh, SPSS software version 23. So all the patients who were aged 18 to 85 years had a stable NSTEMI and had a cabbage done within six weeks of NSTEMI were included. Patients who were unstable or had any other concomitant procedure done with cabbage were excluded. Now coming to the results. So in terms of demographic variables, uh, if you see the groups were well matched in terms of age and gender, average age was around 61 years in all three groups and male gender was predominant in all three groups. In Group B, patients were more obese as compared to the other two groups. While in terms of comorbid, 60 to 70% of the patients were diabetic in all three groups. Uh, patients who had hypertension were more prevalent in group B. And in patients who were operated after six days, uh, more, most of them had a history of previous MI as well. In terms of intraoperative variables, uh, we saw that uh, there was more bypass time, cross claim time, and number of grafts are more in patients who were operated after six days. But the p-values were not significant for this. Uh, similarly, patients who were operated within six days had more rate of blood transfusions. And more of these patients required to be kept open chest and shifted to the CICU. And patients who were operated within 48 hours had more uh, uh, length of IC, ICU stay. Patients who were operated within 48 hours had more incidence of prolonged ventilation, uh, BiPAP requirement postoperatively, IABP placement, uh, surgical re-exploration, atrial fibrillation. In terms of composite outcomes, we took uh, prolonged ventilation, re-exploration, IABP placement, atrial fibrillation, uh, patients requiring hemodialysis, patients who have had a stroke, and operative mortality. So we combined these and uh, considered as composite outcome. So we saw that patients who were operated within 48 hours had more composite outcome, uh, which was 47.6%. And as the time progressed, uh, this graph had a downward sloping trend. Uh, but uh, the p-value for this was not significant, it, it was 0.3. But in terms of percentages, uh, there was a significant downward trend. Uh, we also used a univariate and multivariate logistic uh, regression analysis uh, in order to see the relation of timing on outcomes and uh, whether uh, delaying cabbage does uh, exactly help or not. So when we compared group A with group C, that was uh, patients who were operated after six days, we saw that the p-value was marginally significant. You could say it was 0 0.076, not less than 0 0.05, uh, and the adjusted odds ratio was 0.44. So in a way, it could be said that uh, patients who were operated after six days had a protective effect, and there were 56% less chances of them having the composite outcome. And then we also checked for independent variables which could have uh, effect on the uh, composite outcomes, and we found out that age, uh, that is patients who were above 60 years and patients who had an EF less than 40% ha had independent risk factor for uh, having the composite outcome. So to conclude, delaying cabbage showed reduced risk of having composite outcome, but we were not able to find this as statistically significant. Uh, limitations to my study was this was a single center study. Uh, we had a limited sample size. This was a retrospective study design. And patients who had NSTEMI were only included. There was no control group. My acknowledgments to my department, my faculty, and residents. Thank you.
Thank you, Dr. Asif, for such a nice presentation. Any comments from the panelists? Any take on this, please? Uh, that's a really a nice presentation. Uh, normally what we do, we'd like to wait for some time for our patients are to recover. The standard teaching is the risk of mobility and mortality comes down to the baseline 3% after one week, after ST is STEMI or non-STEMI. Uh, it was a good effort. Uh, that's it. Uh, thank you for the good presentation. So the, so the point is that waiting does decrease mortality of that particular patient, uh, but we don't know the people who die in between and the waiting time. And that's with most diseases that if you wait, like VSR, if you wait, your outcome will get better. But the question is about can you save those patients who die in between early, with the early intervention? So that's still an open question. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, th that was basically the limitation because it was a retrospective study. But uh, if we plan a prospective study, we can better look into this. Dr. Nasser, anything you want to add? If the patient is hemodynamically stable and can wait, you can do uh, uh, in-hospital sort of surgery. Uh, if uh, other factors are again there, if the patient is having left main stem, uh, unprotected left main stem disease and is high risk, uh, uh, but if the patient is uh, hemodynamically unstable or patient is having some sort of mechanical instability like uh, acute MR or the patient is having uh, 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 VSR, in that you will have to intervene earlier to save the life. Uh, in that case you will accept more mortality definitely otherwise patient is, is you, are, you are going to lose the patient so that uh, so the, if the patient can wait yes you you, 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 you wait for some time till the uh, myocardial edema settles but if the if you are losing patient in waiting so it is always better to intervene Yes, sir. Um, uh, thank you for your comment um, and suggestion. Um, yes, so most of the patients that were operated within 48 hours, we saw those had a left main disease. But we had excluded the unstable patients like who were hemodynamically unstable. So those were excluded. But yes, who were operated within 48 hours mostly had a left main disease. We have uh, seen this thing that if the patient who need surgery immediately, if done on <coughs> beating heart, uh, they, this is uh, documented that they have got the better results as compared to if they are done on conventional bypass. They say on conventional, conventional bypass, if we apply cross clamp, this increases the ischemia, which is detrimental in these, these patients. Um, thank you, sir. Um, this was all the patients were on pump. But yes, this is a good point. If you are planning a prospective study, we can keep this in mind. Thank you, Dr. Asib. I would like to thank our panelists, uh, Dr. Imtiaz, Dr. Azam Jan, Dr. Nasir Saab, and Dr. Sh uh, Shahzeb. Thank you, sir, for joining us. I would uh, ask uh, Professor Dr. Azam Jan, uh, sir, if you can please come to the stage and give shields to the presenters. Thank you for a nice uh, end, uh, you know, closing session actually, and it, uh, more interesting talks were uh, left, and we had. Uh, good presentations at the end as well as we had at the start of the conference. And uh, this is uh, what is, uh, you know, uh, good about these conferences, that till the end you hook around to good presentations and good, uh, you know, data from different institutions uh, to define the quality of work which our surgeons are doing within Pakistan. Uh, just a quick, uh, you know, uh, prize distributions and certifications for these uh, presenters. 
May I request uh, Brigadier Imran Asghar to correct uh, his certificate? Dete jaunu. Mera mood ek hai. Mood hai. Kya kar raha hai? Next to connect is uh, Brigadier Imtiaz from AFIC. <laughs> Dr. Hasib Rahman from AKU. Dr. Mansoor Tariq from PIC. Pakhtir Muhammad Amir Khan from AFIC. May I request Dr. Nasser, please sir, if you can connect them. Uh, Dr. Kasser Aleem for a nice left main debate if he is here. Dr. Abid, can you please do the honors to connect his thing? Dr. Asim from uh, HMC Peshawar. Yeah. And uh, Dr. Farhan from Bahawalpur, if he is still around, no? for Bahawalpur. Oh, so we'll, we'll send them that. Uh, yeah, so you're going to Bahawalpur, so we'll give it to Dr. Zubair then. Uh, okay. So thank you, everyone. Um, this brings us to the end of this uh, conference, actually. Started on Friday morning. And we had a lot of uh, interactive sessions, live cases, workshops. The, uh, the, amount, the, the number of people who turned around, the, you know, the amount of response we got uh, was amazing. So I'm really thankful to all the presenters, the participants who had to travel from abroad, who were with, within from Pakistan, but from far flung areas. Uh, from Karachi to Khaibar, everyone traveled for this conference and uh, we had an amazing two and a half days to this conference. Um, first, I would like to thank the uh, sponsors who are still here and uh, with us and uh, we all understand this is not a just a three-day thing. This is a lifetime mutual relationship which we all have and we carry this legacy forward and thank you again for all your help. Um, I'm really thankful to all the organizers, our patron, Professor Rahman, our convener, Shakar Saab, our secretary, very helpful for all the scientific sessions and for all the organizational skills that you had. We, 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 we learned a lot from that. So thank you, for Professor Azam Jan. Um, and then uh, comes down to the surgical team, then the uh, admin team, and the technical teams, and uh, then the event manager. That was the uh, Grace events. To uh, you know, uh, just appreciate their contribution to the conference. Uh, I would uh, request uh, Professor Azam Jan to please be on stage. And I would also request uh, uh, Brigadier Nasser, please, sir, if you can be on stage. Uh, I would also request Dr. Abedullah, please, sir, if you can be on stage. So first, we are going to, um, you know, just uh, uh, say, uh, give a token of, uh, you know, uh, thanks to our uh, sponsors first. 
So the platinum sponsors, that was the highest. And uh, as usual, they were really helpful in the whole conference throughout. And uh, that is Metronix from uh, Pakistan. Can someone please come over? Shazad, yeah, please. Our gold sponsors were uh, Mediquips. Anyone from Mediquips? Yeah. Also, uh, from the gold sponsors category, Verizon. Silver category sponsors were ACP, that is the Microport. Do we have Imran? Yeah. AM Distributors, Mediland Pakistan, Teleflex, Vertex Medical, Hilton Pharma, Ethicon, Jane J. Mindre. And we have other sponsors apart from these categories. Those who contributed to the uh, conference were Ferocens, Gets Pharma, Martin Dove, Pharma Wu, Gets Pharma, um, Pharma Boo, okay. Cardiac Care, yeah, please. Flowtronics, Design for Vision, Stream Surgical, Health tech. All right, and we are all here. We enjoyed these two and a half lovely days, and all the arrangements, all the food, and everything was organized by uh, the event uh, managing, uh, uh, you know, party that is Grace Evento. And I would like to request Masood to please come over, who has been with us for the last few months through all these painful days, and really worked hard. Thank you. Thanks to you and your team for your very hard work to make it a possible, uh, you know, successful conference. <laughs> all right, uh, next comes another important category for all those stood up with uh, me and Azam Saab for the last few months and then for the last few days particularly were all the organizing committee members and the um, uh, you know, the help which we had, it included uh, our surgical team members, uh, we in, which included our admin part, the nurses, our technicians, and, uh, you know, our junior doctors, our residents, everybody was up to the task and available for all the help throughout these days and throughout the last many months which we were, uh, you know, trying to uh, prepare for this thing. 
So the first one I would really like to acknowledge and I would like uh, Brigadier Nasser to award him with the thing is to say thank you to Dr. Azam Jan for being a really uh, big helping hand and uh, And uh, then we have Dr. Kifayatullah, Kifayat. another one from AFIC actually, so yeah, yeah, so um, that's an honor to be receiving an award from you as well because AFIC uh, pro, uh, training, so Dr. Yasser Bilal is here around. Yeah, Yasser, please come over. <laughs> Dr. Wakar Masood, AFIC, previously now PIC. And um, so this was just a doctor category. Another important uh, category is all the people from within PIC management and admins who were really up to the task and really helped us day and night for the last maybe like almost six months when we started preparing. And I really appreciate your effort, guys. You have been amazing throughout these three years actually since PIC has started and heads off to you for all your wonderful work that you are doing and I would like to invite uh, them here to be awarded with these uh, shields. Uh, our director of finance, finance plays a big role in that and uh, Mr. Kashif Zaman, our director of finance. If you have money, you will work If you have not, then the director of finance comes first. Following him is another really instrumental, uh, you know, character in this whole conference thing is, uh, was uh, a director, facility manager, uh, facility, facility and management, uh, Kazi Saad. Kazi Saab has been with us for three years now. And I mean, he never stops to, you know, impress us and surprise us. Thank you, Kazi Saab, for all your effort. I would now call uh, our manager, MMD, Mr. Murtaza, for all your extended help. Kept calling people, kept pulling and pushing people so that uh, this conference uh, becomes uh, a reality. And following him, I'm going to call our uh, another very important part of the team who was looking after the accommodations and all that effort and uh, the uh, other parts of the conference as well. Uh, Mr. Hisham Khan, who is our inpatient manager, really put in a huge effort to this conference. And uh, thank you, Hisham, for your hard work. Previously, it was thought that there is a security issue in Peshawar. Our security manager now made sure that everyone was safe and hopefully be safe and safely reach home. Our security manager put in a big effort with all the, you know, interior ministry, with the uh, intelligence agencies, the local authorities, police, and everyone. Our security manager, Mr. Midrar, Midrar Shah, please, he, he put in all the effort for the security thing. Next is our uh, manager of pharmacy, uh, Mr. Fahim. There were a lot of pharmaceuticals who were involved in the conference who contributed, and Fahim was instrumental in that. I kept this one deliberately down the list because all this lighting effort, the media thing, the IT support, the, the whole thing, and, uh, you know, live broadcasting, uh, collaborating with foreigners, virtual speakers. This was made sure by our director IT, Mr. Muhammad Ali. Please come over. This was a huge effort from you. You know, uh, 
live telecast from CMH uh, to PIC and then uh, from within PIC uh, and all those virtual presentations from uh, across the world. Uh, thank you again for your excellent effort. And all this has been, you know, sent out on all the social media and media accounts, news channels and stuff. Our media manager took care of all of that, that we are over there as well. So I would request uh, and uh, really appreciate and say thank you to Ms. Rifat. Uh, can you come over? Yeah, please. So she had... Re she recently had uh, been not been well because of surgery, and, but she did, uh, you know, made sure that she is here and she took care of all the uh, media and social media uh, part of the thing. Miss um, Sosan, is she around? Another important person of the team, yeah, she contributed a lot by gathering the whole data, the whole thing, com uh, compiling that data and then sharing it with us. Um, apart from that, then we had uh, helpers and organizers and, you know, these ushers for the last three days. We have been helping the uh, delegates towards uh, the tasks and I would like to invite their uh, uh, director, uh, nursing, Mr. Afsardad, uh, if he can come over. Yeah, he, he made sure that all the team is there. Uh, John Seb. <laughs> Bahadur. <laughs> Sajda. <laughs> Sunila. <laughs> Sadaf Nigar. Shafkat, Irfan, Nurul Hadi, Asad, Rima, Faiza, Kajal, Another important uh, help which we got in this conference was were the medical students from RMI actually and Nazim Jan sahab made sure that uh, uh, house officers and their medical, medical officers and students um, are they around here? Okay, so let me start with the, uh, the list. Uh, Dr. Mishal. Oh yeah, there she is. Dr. Hava. Dr. Saba, Dr. Hamid, Dr. Mujib, Dr. Rabia, Dr. Atik, Dr. Ayman, Dr. Verda, Dr. Aqib Ali, Dr. Haseeb, Dr. Khizar, done, okay. Importantly, the photographer, and we need a photograph of you as well to please come over and collect your certificate and we'll get you, uh, get your photograph now. Um, Mr. Irfan, really, Everywhere he covered all the photography session. Another important help we got throughout the thing, the IT in the live session thing specifically with the internet and network and all that. Uh, Mr. Majid, please if you can come over.
Mr. Afkar, he really helped us with the transport and you know uh, the availability and the uh, pick and drop services which he provided throughout the three days. And last but not the least, few of our residents, uh, Dr. Zishan Abdul Nasir. Dr. Zishan Afzal, if he's around. Yeah, thank you. Dr. Ali. Dr. Nisar. Dr. Mansoor Tarek, Dr. Ubaid, Dr. Haseeb. Ubaid, you're having uh, more of an applause now. What is that? Okay, big round of applause for Ubaid, please. He's a special member of our team. Really loved by everyone. Yeah. Okay. Etisham. Dr. Muhammad Afridi. All right, so that brings us to the end of uh, this part as well. I'm really thankful again. But first of all, let me apologize to everyone if there has been any, you know, uh, error or mishap or any uh, thing in this whole conference thing that was not deliberate it may have been you know in, in an unfortunate thing but we apologize for any inconvenience if it happened we re we are really thankful for your presence for your presentations your contribution in any part of the conference thank you all once again allah hafiz One last comment, uh, without the dedication and uh, support of Dr. Tarek, day and night, 24-7 for the last few months, he had been working on it. So a last clap for him and for all the team. Thank you, Dr. Tarek. Okay, thank you. Allah, face everyone. Thank you.